record. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform and by giving you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Right now, we're doing beta tests for our platform and we're looking for people to help us with a beta test. So if you're interested in helping out, reach out to me at jasoncabinets at cabinetshr.com. Our guest today is Kevin Miller. Kevin, are you ready to be great today? Yes, sir. Kevin is from a small town called Killeen, Texas, by the military base Fort Hood, and he lived there most of his life. He found an interest in art and programming through the desire to make video games, video games for his first true hobby. Later, he focused more on art throughout high school after he dabbled in programming because he felt it was too difficult. This was back when he had no C and C++. He eventually decided to shift over to finance because of the promise of big dollars and decided to get a degree in accounting because the local university did not have a finance degree. Um, but unfortunately, he hated accounting and didn't feel competent in it. I was working at a, at a hotel. In the meanwhile, he taught himself to program while at the working hotel. He took off a year of work and decided to focus on, full -time, on programming full time. He eventually got a job after, get, after going through tons and tons of applications. So Kevin, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. No, oh, man, I appreciate you inviting me on here. Yeah, so a uh, little back, so me and Kevin actually known each other for a while. So I know you, those who know me, like I've been trying, I've been doing my Kevin's HR startup for a while. And we're, we're talking about this during, during the podcast, like you know, the challenge of non-tech startup, non-tech founder with tech startup. But Kevin, like one of the first people I reached out to trying to figure out what was doing going on, you know, so we had a, a good back and forth. We had a good history to, with each other. Um, so Kevin, first, um, I'm a military veteran. I retired from the army after 25 years. You're yeah. actually what's called a military brat. Can you find what that term even means so people don't know? You know, I mean, it's pretty much your parents are in the military and, you know, you've been around the military culture your whole life. So, you know, my dad, he was in Korea. I was actually born in Korea, he was stationed in Korea, lived there for two years. Then he moved to Fort Polk when I was around two, lived there for about six years. So Fort Polk is in Louisiana. And then after that, moved to Fort Hood. And, you know, I've been in the Fort Hood, Colleen area. Uh, the majority of my life, probably like 25, 26 years. And, you know, I ended up in a DFW area after I uh, started taking programming seriously. It, it's crazy how like people always have something in common. Like, of course, I'm sure you don't remember, remember anything about Korea, but me and my family were there for three years, oh, five to eight, right? You know, so there's always like, always something people, some common people have in common. You just got to look for yeah. it, I think. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, like the thing about living in those military towns is it's kind of difficult to find a job there unless you know somebody like uh, the surrounding towns usually they don't really have good jobs so you got to get on base and to get a good job on base you probably you have to have an in and I couldn't never really find that in so you know for the majority of my life until I was like 29 I was working you know these small low paying jobs making like you know my first job was uh, McDon uh yeah McDonald's I think I was making around seven dollars an hour then I went to Subway's making like $5 an hour. And when, once I got that hotel job, uh, I started at around $10 an hour. And you know, like five or six years later, I was making 11. So, you know, I just uh, kind of like wasted a lot of my early life, just um, stuck in that small town, not really making progress. But, you know, once I left, uh, left Colleen and went to DFW, man, things just took off from there. Yeah, I think for me, the best example, I guess the worst example of that. So we were stationed for 10 to 8 for two years. So mm -hmm. this is how bad it was for like getting people getting jobs on post or whatever. All the baggers in the commissary were military wives, military spouses, yeah. and all of them had master's degrees. Right. Uh, like, wow. what, what, uh, like, what's going on here, right? Because had those visas, all kind of stuff. All the jobs they get was like baggers, right? And that master's degree. Uh, uh, that just blew me away. How, how, that's just ridiculous, right? Yeah, man, it's, 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 it's hard to get put on uh, unless, you know, like you just really know the right person. Like, yeah, and uh, people don't realize me, the struggle, right? Yeah, exactly. Like I, I was I, I was like literally 29 living at home with my parents because you know, I couldn't find no decent paying job. I mean, all the time, like, you know, people like, you know, spouses, depends, they'll try to find a job. 
Well, why do you, how come there's nothing, you know, there's no job for five years. So you walk this, you know, quote unquote bullshit job, you know, they don't understand. Like, first yeah. of all, you know, if, if you're like depend on military spouse or someone in the military, they know you're going to leave in two years. Right. So instead of them thinking, you know, let me bring on those great talents to make my company better for two years. They were like, okay, we're, we're, you know, we're not going to mess with it. Right. I never understood that mentality mm -hmm. of people. Yeah, man. What's so, what's so crazy about the, uh, the whole job situation, man, is if you're not careful, like you can just get, kind of trapped in mediocrity. Yep. Like, you know, if I just kept staying at that hotel job, you know, it would be on my resume longer and longer and people wouldn't have taken a chance on me. So no. I have to do something to get out. So uh, we're going to talk about TikTok later, but there's a guy following there. He's like a junior college professor from some little college in Texas. And he put on something yeah. that's like pretty good talking about, he's like, he said, at least one semester this happens in the class, right? Uh, still was sort of really good, like making a good grade, like kicking, you know, killing it, you know, doing good. Mm. And then he'll like miss a couple of classes. What's going on? You know, student, I had to take a job, you know, pay bills, whatever. And then, you know, and before you know it, that kid's dropped out. And, you know, and he said, like, you know, the, the, every semester one kid drops out and the fast food industry has a loyal cut, a lower employee the rest of like next 10, 15 years. But what does yeah. the world miss out on? Right. What could this kid done with his life? Now he's a loyal employee at McDonald's or Wendy's or some restaurant, you know, he said he had this once, once every semester with him. Exactly. And you know, the crazy thing was I actually had a, a my, my bachelor's in accounting and I was still at the hotel. So, you know, kind of, it, it kind of re, you know, reiterated that I needed to do something different when I was at a, like a party, a hotel party that they had held for the employees. I was talking to like one of the maintenance guys and he, he was like, you got your uh, degree in accounting? What are you doing here? And, you know, the, the manager kind of looked at him and was like, Shh, like Yeah, you kind of open, like, open your eyes up, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I wanted to do something better, but like with accounting, I never really liked it that much. But, you know, you hear the promise, of, oh, it makes so much money and this and that. So, you know, I, I realized that I would never be a good accountant, so... And plus, like the job prospects for accounting in that small town were like pretty much zero. So uh, I had to kind of re-engineer uh, my thinking and, and try something that I actually wanted to do. And, you know, I heard about coding and just uh, started experimenting with it. And, you know, about a year later, I ended up getting my first job in coding. And it's just blew up since then. So back to military brat. From your point of view, was being a military brat like a advantage or disadvantage for you later on in life? Because if people don't know military brat, the military parents, they move the parents every two years, like, you know, and, and like, I'll, I'll sidetrack a little bit. Like, a lot of people, like, they say they, they don't realize the, the, the uh, sacrifice people in the military, right? They, of course, like, diplomas, all the stuff, but like, what I'm talking about, you know, like, like, no one in my family seen my kids graduate from high school. No one in my family seen, like, my kids play sports. They say me. Mm -hmm. Me and wife didn't see any other niece and nephew anything. And you missed it on that, right? And of course, like, yeah. you have to make new friends every two years, you know. So you get talk about the yeah. challenges or was that advantage, disadvantage that you, from your point of view? I mean, I guess it was, you know, it, it has its ups and downs. Um, like, you know, luckily once we got to Colleen, we pretty much stayed there for like the next, you know, just my parents are still there today. So I've been there for over 20 years. So I have like a long-term group of friends, but you know, if your parent is, parents are active in the military, they start bouncing around. So you know, it could be hard to kind of form long-term connections if you're always moving around. Uh, I guess the good thing is, is like, you know, the, the schools are maybe better than the average public school. But, uh, you know, the high school I went to was like Ellison High School. Uh, it didn't necessarily have the best reputation, but, you know, I still made it through. So, you know, I, I guess overall the military experience, it was a good one because like, all of the friends, most of the friends I have today, they're still from that area. So. Yeah, I, I know I was in Florida four years way back in the day. And even, even back then, cleaning, I have a good reputation, right? It's like people, yeah. you know, like Temple, Belton, Austin, of course, Georgetown, like clean, but like, yeah, you know, clean was a different beast back then. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I kind of grew up uh, like, you know, in the 90s. And you know, that's when all the, the gangs and all of that stuff, all that kind of stuff was going on. So thank God I never really got caught up in it, but, you know, you couldn't really go to the mall or the fairs because people ought to be fighting and, you know, things of that nature. So, well, yeah, I'm just glad I never got caught up with that. So Kevin, next, talk about your interest in art. Uh, yeah, you know, like, uh, you know, I was like video games. I like just like how the characters look. So, 
it's something that I just tried developing on my own. Uh, and I started taking, you know, classes in school. It's kind of like what I wanted to do. But so you say, are you, are you talking about a graphic design or game design, stuff like that? Oh, yeah, more like sketching, like okay. uh, actually drawing, and, okay. uh, painting and that stuff. Uh, but, you know, I thank God my parents never let me go to art school because, uh, you know, a lot of people come out of art school with like 200K in debt and they can't find a job. Yeah, so. it's a reason they call it starving artists, right? Yeah, exactly. They know how to so, draw, but you have no idea how to run a business. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, they, they don't, the, the, the art business in general doesn't really pay you well. So I kind of dodged a bullet on that one. Yeah. Um, so talk about how video games were your first true hobby. I mean, ever since I was like three years old. Uh, Any particular video? Was it like you were cooked on Madden or like like games like Fortnite and like Sims or what was your go-to back in the day? Oh, okay. So like, yeah, I started playing when I was uh, three and, uh, you know, I'm 37 now. So, you know, I spent back when the original NES was out. So I got started on like uh, the original Mario. Do you see the original games? Yeah, yeah, I still have all of my games. I, I never, oh, like, man. I think I'll, oh, yeah. Well, how much is that stuff worth? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, if, you, if you actually look at the prices, man, these uh, video games are selling like crazy now. Like, uh, you know, Super Nintendo game, you might be able to sell it for 100, 200 bucks a piece, depending on the title. So I'm sure it's, it's worth a pretty good fortune now. So so, you, so your wife ain't made you get rid of them? Like, what, what do you do with all this kid stuff? Get rid of this, Kevin. You take them on my space. Oh yeah, and I ain't nobody. Nobody's gonna tell me to get rid of the video game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What What about you? Did you ever get into video games? Or? I did. I was like, I used to play Madden a lot. You know, back in the day. You know, of course, oh, the, okay. stuff. Yeah, I never like got hooked up on like a lot of my friends did. You know, like I can't remember the names of the games they used to play back in the day. You know, Man, it can be addicting though. Like uh, you know, those MMORPGs. Once people get on them. They just play them nonstop for like 10, 12 hours. So, um, yeah, def you, definitely you, addictive, right? And of course, yeah. what, what the joke is like back in the day, your parents would tell you, you know, get off, the, get out your video game, go play. And I was like, you better get back and play the video game. You can make hundreds of thousands of dollars of eat, playing like esports yeah. or, you know, whatever the case would be, right? You know, like, yeah, I would have never imagined you like kids are literally making millions of dollars playing video games, like streaming it on Twitch. Like, and who would have thought that people, would pay to watch someone play a game like okay this yeah. is this is ridiculous but when you think about like if you're playing madden like all your friends back at your house you know might be eight of you you know only two can play at a, at a game at a time where you don't do something matter to like in person only two can play at a time so all the six are obviously watching you right so i guess it's not that far-fetched you know just uh, yeah yeah we're kind of in a unique time to where like if you can get a big audience you can pretty much do anything and profit off of it so yeah, it's all about branding and, you know, have a presence out there, you know, put yourself out there some kind of way, right? You can't be scared, as they say. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much why I started, like, my own podcast and started doing videos. Like, you know, it hasn't really blown up yet, but it can't blow up if you don't put anything out there. Yeah, but you haven't, you don't, how long have you been doing, like, six months, right? You've been doing a kind of short amount of time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, on LinkedIn, I'll... Uh, I've only been posting for like maybe a couple of months, uh, but on yeah, and it seemed like you get a lot of good engagement on LinkedIn. A lot of people making comments and going back and forth, and, and some pretty big name people too, you know. Yeah, I've actually been uh, doing way better on LinkedIn than any other platform. Like YouTube, my videos get like five views, or you know, something like that. Some ridiculous, but like on LinkedIn, I actually had a good month where from like December one to the mid midpoint of January this month. Uh, I got like 1.5 million views of like, nice. you know, total. So I actually got some sort of traction on LinkedIn. So yeah, I think I'm gonna focus on that platform. So what made you decide to start posting on social media? What clicked in your mind to say, I need to start doing this? So I mean, it's just, that's just something I've been doing for like the longest, like Facebook, just kind of posting my thoughts and, you know, like posting on message boards. Uh, that's just something I enjoy doing. So, so I kind of so like, what do you get out of, what do you get out of it? Uh, I, I you know, I kind of like helping people, you know what I mean? Like, uh, if, if I just think about how to improve myself and just sharing that advice with others. And, you know, I, at, at a certain point I was like looking at, um, you know, like YouTube and all this, this other stuff. It's like people are literally making, uh, millions of dollars just opening packages. Like, 
why don't I at least make an effort to get myself out there more? Like, who knows where it could lead? And so how do you deal with, I guess, the call trolls or haters, like when people like put negative stuff on there or say like, Kevin, you're wrong, or Kevin, this sucks, or Kevin, this, or how do you deal with the negativity that's out there? Man, uh, interestingly enough, man, I haven't really had that much negativity. And I'm guessing it's because like, you know, LinkedIn is more professional. People not just going to go go off on the deep end like they would on uh, Twitter or YouTube where they have anonymity. You know, like if they got to post a real picture and you know, there's job repercussions, they, they kind of call their comments a little more. So, uh, but, but you know, like on other platforms, you just got to kind of ignore it. Like you don't know this guy. So why, why does his opinion matter? You know what I mean? You just ignore it and keep going. Like, uh, like even me getting into programming, I'm sure a lot of people didn't think I could do it. Like, no, he'll probably be stuck in Colleen forever. He'll probably be stuck in the hotel industry forever though. Just like, whatever, I'm gonna ignore it. I'm gonna just keep doing it. Like it's something I enjoy. So like their opinion, like people that hate their opinion holds like little relevancy. Yeah, I'm gonna read some of the people like who, that you originally know, like back in high school or whatever their opinion of you is never going to change. Like you could be like, you could come like yeah. the next Elon Musk, you know, and whatever the case may be, you're going to invent a new programming language to them. You always be the same Kevin Miller. Who's done, never doing anything with their life because yeah. they never did, did anything with their life. And they can't admit to themselves that someone did something better than them. Yeah, you know, like interestingly, like in the Bible it says, Jesus says like a prophet is never accepted in his own hometown. And you know, that's true. Like it is the people that know you, they, they don't respond to you. Like on Facebook, I was posting this stuff, no responses take it to LinkedIn, way more response. So sometimes you just got to get in the right crowd. That's, that's very true. Very true. So Kevin, so um, talk about how you started working in the hotel. Uh, actually, like, so I, I was taking these uh, accounting classes and one of my friends in the accounting class, he actually put me on, like, I was trying hard to find a job. I couldn't find anything, man. But uh, he, he, he approached me one day and say, uh, you know, you know, at the hotel, they're looking for somebody, man, uh, you want this job? I said, yeah. And, you know, he just pretty much introduced me and I uh, ended up getting that job. So that was like a counter even, bookkeeping job. Was it like a front desk job? What was it? Oh, well, um, it was actually like a night audit job, you know, where you stay overnight and you kind of watch the front desk and, you know, you probably do paperwork. Um, that, that's the kind of job that was. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, your video went out. Okay. Let me. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you're back uh, on now. Okay. So basically, not the type of your job you 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 wanted for yourself going through college, right? Like, well, like uh, for for a college job, it was good because it's like it gave me a ton of free time. You know, like my my hours were eleven at night to seven in the morning. So you know, everybody's pretty much sleeping when I'm working at the front desk. So I, you know, it gave me a lot of time to just uh you know do stuff like programming or look up whatever but um it was kind of a dangerous job too right yeah you're talking so, about that wasn't like the, the best job to have right oh yeah man uh you know because i was the only employee in the hotel like there's no security there's nothing it's just, just me and was this in clean up in dallas fort worth uh colleen so i was still in colleen at oh, that man. time yeah so seems like that's what you had to say night hotel job in colleen yeah you, you needed you probably need to have hazard hazard duty job pay or like a weapon or something yeah I, I felt like i needed to start taking one up there man but you know thank god like a little while later i just got into programming because yeah that, that job was stressing me out so wait are you talking about this a little bit before but what, what made that you to click like you know I'm, I'm at a hotel i'm making decent money i guess i'm still living with my parents I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I do something better. What, like, cl what clicked and what clicked it to, towards programming? Why not something else? Why programming? Uh, you know, like programming, that was always something I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I was start, that this was the time when the industry wasn't super saturated. Like now it's almost impossible to get in. Like that was during the time where they was like, oh yeah, we, we need programmers, we need warm bodies. So, you know, if you can showcase your skills, we have a position for you. So, you know, like I was doing a lot of Excel work and I was like, let me just try this out. Like, let me automate some of these tasks. So, you know, I was playing around with VBA and it, it kind of made doing a lot of the tasks way quicker. So, you know, just that little bit of success told me, okay, maybe I can do this. So, you know, I just kept with it, kept learning for a little while. And then 
And you so, so you're self-taught. You didn't, you didn't go to college or a building boot camp or nothing like that. It's just self-taught. Yeah, just self-taught. Um, pretty much like reading books from cover to cover. Um, you know, going through the projects and deploying them. You know, and you know, I pretty much had that same attitude today, man. I, I spent a fortune on uh, programming books and courses. I probably got uh, thousands of courses on Udemy. So when you you were applying to jobs. And basically, I'm sure they found out you're self-taught. What were most recruiters hiring managers reacting to you? Like, man, we're not going to hire you because you're self-taught. You know, there's no way you can teach yourself. Or they opened, like, you know, that you can actually do this by yourself. And I have to, like, spend thousands on school. Uh, I think, you know, that during that time, you know, they, they were more open to non-traditional. Like, you didn't have to have a computer science degree. So as long as, you know, they, they would give me the conversation and I could demonstrate, you know, what I was talking about because I knew what I was talking about, like, if you de deploy a project from scratch, you kind of know the ins and outs. So you're able to answer their questions. So since I was able to answer their questions and showcase my projects, and also had like a programming blog, the programming blog that was kind of like what really caught the eye of the company that really uh, that yeah. eventually that, hired me that that's first that's, I think that's genius right there. Have a programming blog, yeah, that's very smart on your part, I think. Yeah, so, you know, I kind of take that, the, that same philosophy now and, you know, I started doing the videos and the podcast because that's, that, that's kind of like what distinguishes me from somebody who's just a, just a resume, you know. They just have experience, like, whereas, like, they can see me, they can attach, like, a face to the, you know, to the post, to the resume. They say, okay, this guy's really serious about programming, you know. So, so Kevin, when you first started out, you learned how to program. Well, do you have like any mention any, when you reach out to like pose you were stuck on a problem? Do you have anyone you could reach out to or you just you just had to figure it out yourself? Yeah, man, I, I pretty much just have to figure things out myself. Um, just reading books from cover to cover. And, you know, like after a while you figure out a lot of people don't really read programming books or go all the way through the courses. So if you're going through the, the book all the way, you're going through the course all the way, you, you probably end up with more knowledge than a recruiter or not the, not the recruiter, the interviewer. Like, you just got to get in there, do it, fail, analyze, try it again. So. So what, what coding language did you learn first and why did you pick that language to learn? Like back in the day, uh, you know, before, you know, when I first started learning programming, you remember I told you, like, I want to make video games and all of that. Um, you had to use C or C++. Like there wasn't nearly as many resources as there are now. So. That's what intimidated me and drove me away the first time. But when I came back to it, uh, I learned uh, JavaScript. And, you know, the cool thing about that is, uh, you know, you can just do it in a browser. You don't have to download all this fancy software, all these compilers. You just type it up and just run it in the um, in a browser. So I was actually able to do that at work. And uh, that's that's kind of like what it, and, you know, enabled me to get a little bit of taste of that. And, and also mentioned uh, VBA. That was another thing. Uh, that actually had like a direct correlation on the job and dealing with Excel spreadsheets. But uh, during that year I took off to learn programming, um, I learned uh, Ruby on Rails and that's kind of like what I deployed my uh, programming projects in. So Ruby on Rails and JavaScript. And you know, ever since I got my first job, I never touched Ruby on Rails again, but <laughs> yeah. So, when did it click on you? Like you're studying, you're doing the stuff. When did it click on you that, you know, when did, when did the light bulb goes, you know, like, hey, I'm actually pretty good at this and I actually can make a career out of this. I'm actually decent. I know what I'm doing. This, I think I could do this a career and make something of myself. When did that click? How did that click with you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, once once my money started running low, because like, you know, every month, like I, I had like $10,000 saved up. So when I took the year off, you know, every month I'll give my parents like $400. So you know, uh, once the money started getting long, I'm like, man, I, I can't, can't just sit around doing this. Like, I have to start applying. I have to, you know, do something to generate income. So, you know, once I was able to talk to some of these companies and uh, the first company that seemed really interesting to me was a company called Rackspace. It was uh, out there in uh, San Antonio. Yeah, they're like um, something like a Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, like a cloud service company, right? Yeah, yeah, like one of them type of companies. And, uh, you know, I actually interviewed with them and they were like, okay, yeah, we, you know, we really like you, uh, but, you know, the only position we have open is for like, you have to have like a couple of years of experience. So, but just them saying like, 
oh yeah, you're doing good stuff. This is good code that kind of like, you know, gave me an idea that I, I was cut out for this. <laughs> like, yes, this is possible. Exactly. So yeah. next, um, talk about some like, so I think a lot of people, they get into coding, right? And yeah. they don't realize how difficult it is to keep up to date with everything, right? Cause like everything changes all the time. Mm. And, and most jobs, I mean, I could be wrong. I'm sort of, I come to like Google and Apple, I like give you time to improve or whatever. But most likely we're really good software remote jobs. Like if you say, hey, I'm gonna take three hours off. I won't get paid to do something. Like they're gonna say, no, you're not doing time, right? Talk about having like the flexibility and the prioritization skills, like keep up to date on everything. Okay. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, a lot of company, a lot of companies are probably not gonna give you time to study. So you're gonna have to spend a lot of time outside of work and doing this stuff. Uh, so I can imagine it's harder for people with families, but luckily for me, I didn't have a family. I was able to just spend a bunch of time outside of work just studying it, getting my skills up to par. But um, yeah, this ended, you know, jumping into the industry is it's really not easy because uh, a lot of people, they probably won't help you out that much. And you kind of expect to get up and go. And, you, you know, I think a lot of people look at uh, new developers as competition. So they don't necessarily want to teach you to possibly eventually replace them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, luckily I had that the um the self-taught the self-learning uh motivation like I'm, I'm able to just teach myself stuff and you know if you're initially it's hard but if you have that attitude and they're able to see you're able to get things done on your own pretty soon like you can become like an authority because okay he knows this body of knowledge and you know nobody else in this company has it he just went out and got it himself so you know if you, if you can't find a mentor, you just you just got to be able to go out there and get the knowledge yourself. You know, use and nothing, every... yeah. nothing like you said, go to Udemy, go to YouTube. I mean, yeah. you know, find a mentor on YouTube, right? You know, there's plenty of people out there who like teach you how to do stuff, you know? Exactly. Like there's so much free stuff now. Like there's, there's no excuse really. Like uh, I think the site I used uh, was uh, Code Academy or something. So, uh, it's like one of those interactive sites to where you can kind of like type in code and see the results and it tells you this is correct this isn't correct like there's just so much like free stuff or you can buy a course off of udemy for like 12 bucks like there's nothing yeah. courses. come on one time i was researching like python courses on youtube and i found this free youtube python course and there's one comment somebody put on there i have a four-year degree and i learned more in these three hours from you than you learned my four years in computer science my university Exactly. That, that's how it is. So next, talk about, uh, I think it's called whiteboard interview. So first, I want, uh, first part of the question is, what is a whiteboard interview? And what, what's your opinion of it? I, I read some places, like some people say they don't like whiteboard interviews because anxiety, you know, it's pressure. Yeah. Other people say, well, they, they rather prefer whiteboard interviews because they have a family, they have stuff going on. There's no way they have, have time to do an interview, like a, a project at home, right? So what's your take on all, all that? So, you know, like a whiteboard interview is kind of like where they ask you to so solve a coding problem, but instead of typing it in the computer and seeing the result, they kind of want you to whiteboard it out in pseudo code. And, you know, me personally, I'm not really a fan of that because it doesn't really reflect what you're going to be doing on a job day to day. But I guess I can see the value in it because it, it's not really about the correct result. It's more so like they're seeing if you can think on your feet and your thinking process how you react under pressure i don't particularly care for it but i can see why some companies do it um i would prefer to like if i was interviewing somebody i'll probably do you know have them do a live coding exercise obviously there's going to be that same uh nervousness but you know it's actually something that's relevant to the job you're gonna have to code on the job so you know i'm not asking you to do something that there's no correlation to the job. So it seems nowadays, and maybe this has been going on for a while, right? You know, and this is my opinion, based being here in Seattle and other places, like if you're like a senior developer, it's like they change jobs when they want to. Like they'll quit a job, have a better paying job in two weeks. Yeah. Junior developers, not so much, right? It's like, it's a yeah. real struggle for them to find a job, right? You know? And like yeah. you said, that company was like, you know, um, we need two experience for an entry level job. Like, come on now, you're kidding right now? 
Yeah. Um, so that's a struggle. It's far harder from their job. And I think a lot of coding academies set for fair, right? Because coding academies, they charge a lot of money. And they say, once you finish, you get $100,000 of your job somewhere. Like, is, oh, is, it, is it true? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, right? And I know a lot of coding academies here in the Seattle area, they'll say, you graduate from this boot camp and be a full stack engineer. Like, that's BS, right? I mean, yeah. I know Seattle developers who say they would never, ever claim they're a full stack developer, right? Never, right? And so I think a lot of them get a, get a bad advice. A lot of it too is like them being a, being a really literacy too. Like a lot of them think I'll, I'll graduate and you know I have a job the next day, right? Can you talk about some of the struggles that junior developers have right now or have been having and probably have in the future finding their first job? Man, that's, uh, that's pretty much why I made those uh, set of posts that just eventually went viral about the interviewing process. Cause I was talking to a bunch of junior developers and they're talking about like, oh, I had to put 500 applications in you know, I'm going through seven rounds of interviews and, uh, you know, they're asking me to, you know, do all the, all these lead code problems and, you know, weird stuff like, oh yeah, we want you to rotate a matrix. It's like, uh, this is, this is a junior JavaScript developer job. Like, whoa, what, what are you trying to test for? You know what I mean? So it's I'll push that back on a little bit. Right. So mm -hmm. I know according to stats, any job, you're going to have an average of 250 applications, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. And then do you think they're, they're getting these like harder tests to not prove they can do the job, but prove they can think at a different, different aspect, like there's a different way of thinking. And they want to see how you can think when you're challenged, what will you do if you're not given the right resources? Well, you know, like the thing is, is okay. Say I'm testing for a front end, you know, react position. I want them to come in and be able to do some react code but like how the interview process is now is like okay we're going to ask you some random leak code questions so uh a problem i've been hearing from developers is they say i i, I don't actually have time to build websites because i have to grind on leak code all day so they might be able to answer you know the interview question but they're not actually equipped to do the job because they don't have time to actually do react or you know angular or whatever so you know i guess like it, it could be it could be an interesting thinking exercise, but I'd much rather have somebody that's like, okay, I have the skills to come in and I understand the framework. I can kind of like dive into the code, but I can, I can understand why other companies want, you know, people that are, you know, supposedly data structures and algorithms masters. But how I feel is like, there's a limited set of time. You can only be so good at something because you don't have infinite time. So. Do I want them to be grinding on theoretical problems all day, or do I want them to start off with something more practical? Like, you know, the purpose of data structures and algorithms is pretty much to be able to do things efficiently. But if they don't even know how to build something in the first place, how can they? How can they be efficient? You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely think some interviews is too much, right? Like, I know a lot of people say, you know, for hiring and firing, like, you know, hire slow, fire fast. Mm -hmm. My my perspective, like. No one ever fires fast, right? No one, you know, we usually yeah. fire someone, everyone knows they should have been gone, right? Cause like, but like, it's like, you know, while it's Christmas, it's the anniversary, it's whatever, right? And for you know, they're mm -hmm. still there. And I'm not saying like, you know, hire someone the first day you've seen them, but like seven yeah. interviews, I, I don't know about that. That's, that seems yeah. like, that's it, right? Like, and, and I don't care how many interviews you do or what do you do? You never know if someone's gonna work out with you until they work with you, right? And already exactly. they're hiring. Of course you gotta know, and, and most states are at will, right? I mean, you can have bring on someone for two months. It doesn't work out. Let them go. As long as you don't grow up for like, you know, one of the title seven things. You can't, you can't mm -hmm. do like race, color, religion. But there's nothing wrong. In most states, it'll say, hey, hey, you know, Jason, we'd hired you. It's not working out. You know, here's mm -hmm. just pay, right? But, you know, like seven interviews, that's, that just seems excessive, right? Yeah, it seems expensive. Yeah. And, and, you know, of course, it, that works for Amazon. You know, Amazon model, you know, you put yeah. an application in. You won't even get an email of like another six months usually, right? And like it could hire two years, but Amazon's Amazon, right? Right, exactly. They, they got the funds and, you know, they I'm sure they got people that's just dedicated to just interviewing. That's all they do. But other companies, they got to pull senior developers off projects. So he's not contributing to the code base. He's just going round after round with these juniors. It's like, what, what, what are y'all doing? Yeah, so you think another reason why there's so many interviews, because, you know, whether it's true or not, I think a lot of developers have like this stereotypical, you know, introverted, work by themselves, not really team players, you know, don't really like to collaborate. And is the is a intent of having these other interviews to see the real person, right? Is this person really going to be collaborative, really going to work around with us? Uh, I think uh, most of it is coming from them trying to copy the big boys like Google, Amazon, Facebook, 
like, oh, it works for them. So maybe it'll work for us. But I don't think so because the circumstances are completely different. Um, yeah, because Google can afford to have like 100 coding jobs empty for the six months. If right. you're a mid-sized company or a startup with 20 people, can you really afford to have even one developer position empty? Exactly. If, you, if you do, your startup, you have one developer position empty, you're not building a product, you don't have your product, can't get your MVP, can't get product market fit, can't get customers, can't invest. It's a whole soccer, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't really see what, what, what they're doing with five to seven rounds of interviews. Like, what, what are they asking? Like, uh, why can't you determine that in three interviews? And what happens all, the, happens all the time, they'll do the six, six seven interviews. Okay, we're going to offer so and so a job. They took another job. I thought they wanted to work yep. with us. Well, they did, but the seven interview, that was just too much. And they got to offer, for, actually, offer for even less money than here. And they, you know, they're done, you know. Yeah, yeah these guys, they, you know, so especially if they're good, they, they're, they're interviewing with multiple companies. They're getting multiple offers. So you got you to you hurry up and get them before they go to the other company. Like, uh, you know, most, 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 when you interview, you never really interview with just one company just for the fact that you want to have leverage during the interview. That's how you, you know, it's almost like buying a car. Like you don't just pull up yeah. to the first car lot. Oh, here's the first car. Okay, you just drive off with the car. You go to a multiple car lot sales, such and such offer me a car for 35,000. Can you do better than that? You know? Like, yeah, and I always advise people, even if you have the best job ever in the world, you should always go accurately look for a job every six months. Like yeah. maybe not make it public, but like, you know, apply for a job, put your application out there, your resume, like every six months to see what kind of hits you get, right? I mean, you never know. Yeah. And it's like a proven fact now, like if you stay with the same company like three, four, five years, you'll lose up to 20 to 30% earning potential, right? Like you have yeah. to get a new job every two years, right? It's it's the way of the world, you know? And like people say, oh, you're not loyal. Well, like a few years ago, you know, all these companies laid everyone off and, you know, you know and, yeah. and pretty much hit them out their 401ks, you know? So what's the call, saying that it was good for the gander is good for the goose, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, loyalty two ways. I kind of learned about loyalty, you know, my first job, I was planning on staying there for a while, but after a year, he's like, okay, uh, we got to let you go. Then, you know, I had just signed a new lease, you know? So it's kind of like, like, can you give me, can you give me some kind of warning? Like, Hey, maybe a month before hey, things ain't going too good. Yeah. You might have to let you go in a month. And then you would understand the partner wouldn't sign that lease. Exactly. So, you know, it just lets you go and, and now you're left to scramble, you know. So it's kind of like, you know, these companies, they'll be fine without you. Like you, you oh, think yeah. that it isn't, they're not just going to completely crumble. They'll just bring in somebody else. So like if you, you work, if you work at a company and you die today, trust me, within at the most two weeks, there'll be a job, a job out there, you know, yeah. recruiting for, for you, you know. Exactly. So I think it's like you got to be respectful. Like, OK, you hired me. I'm going to give you a year or two of work. But after that, then, OK, I'm, I'm open to leaving. Like, you, you don't want to just want to come in. The, you know, they bring you on one month later, you're gone. Because yeah. it's kind of like. I, I think a year is a pretty good, a good thing, a year, you know. Um, yeah, I think a, a good a year is a good thing. And one, I'm somewhere put this somewhere. Like, like when a business lays people off, you know, it, it's, it's good for the business. It's a good business decision. Yeah. But when an employee quits, you know, they'll bring this lawyer, right? It can't be both ways, I don't think. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, for, for my, at my current job, uh, you know, they, the, they just didn't renew the contract. So all these UI, UX guys, they just got laid off, you know, and this is right before Christmas, you know, so you never know when, when the cut could be coming. So, you, you, you know, as much as you want to be like good and loyal, you just thinking at the same company, you're going to be underpaid and you know, the, the loyalty is not necessarily reciprocated. You could be there for three or four years and they'd be like, you need to save some money. Your job's gone. Yeah, yeah. Especially nowadays, you know, with all the opportunities out there for people, you know, like you said, make YouTube videos, do side gigs, yeah. remote work. It's just, yeah, it's there's so many ways to make money nowadays, not to be tied down to one company and, and risk everything with yeah. that one company. Yeah, man, so this is a bad idea to put all your eggs in one basket. That's kind of like why uh, I've been working on it, just increasing my visibility. Because, uh, man, like before I, I started doing the videos, um, I never really had like a big company hit me up. But ever since I started posting a lot on LinkedIn and doing the videos, I had recruited like, you know, people from Oracle, Microsoft, Facebook. You get, you get known, Amazon. definitely. You get known, you get a name, you get a brand name, you know. I mean, you have a brand now, Kevin. I mean, most people don't have, yeah. I mean, everyone has a brand. It might be a shitty brand or a no name brand, but you know, everyone needs a brand, right? Cause like, and, exactly. and, and like with you, like, suppose you decide to quit your job and start looking for another job and someone else quit their job 
The other person had like nothing, nothing on social media. Like I'm pretty sure if you Google Kevin Miller, stuff's gonna come up, you know? Yeah. Google some other random person, like, you know, John, Jason, Michael, whatever, nothing comes up. Cause yeah. people say they don't like, they don't like, uh, like LinkedIn stalk you or do Google searches on you looking for a job. They do. Yeah, they, they do. do. First of all, they wanna make sure you're not doing nothing crazy that's gonna hurt the company, right? right? They wanna say we have out there, right? So like, yeah, it's, and people don't get it. And it's not the hard to do either, I don't think. And uh, you, you remember that uh, one post that I had made, you commented on it and, uh, you know, the, the reply from someone was kind of like, why should I have to do this? But Yeah, yeah. You yeah. do. <laughs> I mean, it's the game, right? I mean, you have to play the game of it, right? It's, I mean, yeah, like, you know. You're the best whatever in the world and no one knows about it, right? It's like you, you can yeah. draw the greatest pain in the world. You don't tell people about it. No one's going to see it, right? Exactly. And maybe you know, that's like, what you want, but I don't know. It is, you know what I'm saying? Like real life is in like school where, okay, you you, you turn an excellent project, the, the teacher gives you praise and a sticker. Like you have to advertise yourself. Like, you know, you're standing next to five other people. Why, why are they going to pick you? You know, so marketing, getting yourself out there. You know, that's that's just as important as your technical skill. Yeah, you have to be a whole package nowadays, right? You can't be a one trick pony, so to speak, I guess, is what they what the thing yeah. is now. And yeah, the thing so, with so. The thing with branding yourself, it's I would say it's, it's it, it, unnat even to me, I still like I'm uncomfortable like putting the camera doing videos, right? Yeah, but you, you get used to it. it's like a muscle memory, right? Eventually you get used to it. And but the thing with it, like you have to do it all the time. Like I remember one time I was doing it for a while. Whatever I stopped for two weeks, right? Something came up, I was what, two weeks, and then when I tried to do it after the 14 days, it was so hard. Like you're doing this hundreds of times, right? But after a two week, I just like, oh man, this sucks. Like, what am I doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, me personally, man, I, I don't, I'm not like a talkative guy, I'm kind of like a almost anti social. I stay to myself. Like, so for me to actually be on video, that's, that's an amazing thing. Like, I have to kind of like force myself to get on video. But once you start, like you say, it gets easier and easier, and it opens up a lot of doors. That's that's the main thing. So next, let's talk about this. So there's a lot of people out there who are, who have no experience in tech. They're starting to try to start mm -hmm. a company, and the biggest challenge is trying to find a tech person, right? I think yeah. the challenge is like you know. So first of all, it's like you know, do you want to do an intern? You know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Mm -hmm. but they really know what they need to do. You know, there's stuff like Fiverr, Upwork, right? But on Fiverr, Upwork, you someone who charges hundred dollars an hour. Like, man, hundred dollars an hour, can I really afford that? You know, are they going to rip me off? Or yeah. you know, someone's just starting out. Ryan, I can afford it, but do they really know what they're doing, right? Yeah, it's it's so hard for for a non tech person to find the right tech team, right? Can you talk about your advice on for them, those people? Um. Well, I would say what what they should do maybe is like reach out to a senior tech guy and pay him and say, hey, uh, we want you to interview guys for our you know our company or something. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. because if if you're not experienced with tech, you're not going to really be able to assess these guys' skills. They can tell you anything. Yeah, I, I think so many tech people you tell them, hey, I want you to build this for me. Can you do it? And they'll say yes, even yeah. though they know they can't write. They just want to yeah. say yes. One either one because you know they have the ego. Oh, I can build anything. I just learned this. It's a new code. If I know PHP, mm -hmm. I can learn, you know, Python, no problem. Yeah. Or they're like being, you know, dishonest, you know. Exactly. Or they say, I can build this in 100 hours. But then, you know, not telling you the 100 hours, 20 of them to learning what they got to do, right? And other stuff yeah. coming up, you know. Yeah, you don't want to pay them to be learning. Like you're paying them to build something. And, you know, like you say, with the dishonesty thing, uh, sometimes you think you're getting some kind of custom solution. They're just building a site on like Wix or Webflow and say, oh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Uh, WordPress templates. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's great advice to have to find some kind of senior tech person. But you know, a lot of people have ideas, um, but they don't know any tech people, right? What are the best ways to meet a tech person? I'm a, I mean, because like, those are like meet us in Van Brights. Of course, I'm in the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. You're in Dallas. It's pretty easy to find tech people there, I would think. Yeah. How about people like places like, I don't know, like Colleen, Texas, or, you know, Wichita Falls, Texas, or Lubbock, Texas, or uh, town like maybe not a college well Lubbock's not a good example mm -hmm. to have Texas Tech but a town with no tech people there what's your what's your advice for them to try to find people you know, they, they just need to leverage the power of, like the internet especially LinkedIn you know like Colleen not going to find very many tech people so you know you're wasting your time in these small cities pretty much so you know get get on LinkedIn reach out to you know different tech people have have conversations I had I've actually had like you know like business owners reach out to me and ask me for advice you know just read, you know what I'm saying? You don't necessarily even have to pay, pay them initially. Just say, hey man, uh, 
I noticed that you seem to have expertise. You, do you mind if I get a little bit of your time and ask you a couple of questions? And then and they say, okay, yeah, sure. And uh, you say, okay, I'm trying to start a new business. Um, I'm trying to hire some juniors. What do you recommend I do? And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you find one that you really like his advice, and you can ask him, hey, uh, you mind if I um, take a few hours of your time um, and I'll pay you for it? Uh, can you, you know, take a look at these juniors for me and tell me what you think about this guy? You know, and, you know, they showcase the portfolio and all of that. And, you know, one thing a senior will be able to do is he'll, he'll be able to, like, look at the code. He'll be able to see, like, okay, like, something I like to do is, um, you know, somebody shows me their portfolio site. I'll, I'll look in, inside the source code. I inspect it. And, you know, if I see something like WP Dash, I know they're using WordPress. Or, you know, you can look in a source code and see Wix.com. So that tells you that they didn't really make that site from scratch, you know. But somebody that's not really tech savvy, they might not be able to pick up on that. So that's why I say it's important to get somebody that kind of knows what they're doing. That, that's great advice. So talk about this, Nick. So I think there's definitely a disconnect in how developers talk and how like non-developers talk, right? Mm -hmm. Example I use all the time. Like if I say, you know, uh, hey, Bob, open the door for me. Bob's going to get up, open the door. Mm -hmm. For a developer, I guess, hey, Bob, developer, get up at a 90 degree angle, Press your chair at a 16 degree angle. Use 60 percent of thrust to, to go to, towards the door. Yeah. You know, exa no example. But like you know, most people you tell them you know do things one to ten. Develop you got to do like not even one. You got to do one A, one B, one C, one D. Yeah. And is it the responsibility of the developer to tell the non tech person, hey, this is how you need to talk to me, or is something the, the tech non tech person needs to know? Like how do you get to the divide or the disconnect? Like this, they're talking different ways, right? Uh, I think it's, it's pretty much up to both of them to say, let, let's meet on the even ground. This is what I need from you. And the other guy said, okay, this is what I need. Because I think like with development, um, you have to be very careful. You know, so somebody says, I want this feature. You know, the developer said, well, what exactly do you need? Like, how do you need it? You know, because- But how many developers actually say that? How many developers are actually like, okay, you need this feature, I'll develop it for you. And, don't, and, and they don't, and the developers ask the D2 question they need to, act, to get the job done. It is, okay, he wants this, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make it for him. Yeah, because, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you're purchasing a product, is is ultimately, uh, you know, you purchase a developer's time, I guess it would be ultimately be up to you to uh, get exactly what you want. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, obviously you can uh, hit him with a bad review if he gives you something, you know, pretty bad. But, um, you know, if you're spending your money, I guess ultimately it'd be like, this is exactly what I want. You know, he should uh, communicate with you and say, hey, uh, this is impossible. This is possible. Or I need more clarity here. Because, um, you know, the last thing you, you want as a developer is to spend like 10 hours developing a feature and then you bring it, he brings it to you and you're like, uh, what is this? Like, why isn't it, it how I'm picturing it in my mind? You know what I mean? Like what he's picturing when you ask for a feature and what you may want may be two completely different things. So, you know, if a developer is asking you for specifics, that's a good thing. So you can deliver exactly what you want. And, you know, I, obviously I'll probably, I'll probably be more skeptical of the guy that doesn't ask for specifics. He said, oh yeah, I can build that because you probably get something you don't want. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Tell me your opinion about this. And this is my personal opinion. It's like, from my experience, a lot of developers, they love to build stuff. They, they're always building stuff in other projects. Yeah. They're very completed project, right? Can you talk about that some? Or am I just, I'm, 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 not, I'm not seeing that right. Yeah. Uh, like me personally, I, I really complete projects because it's like a lot of exploratory learning. Like, you know, you just build projects just to learn a new technology. You know what I mean? You don't want to just be stuck on a, you know, the same project for years at a time unless you just have an idea. You know, like a lot of developers, they don't, they're not really idea people. Like they're not like, okay, I want to build the next best calendar application, the next best fitness application. They're kind of like, oh, I want to see how to build this in Python. I want to see how to build this in C sharp. So, you know, they're, they're halfway complete a project. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think I know C sharp pretty well. And then, you know, they'll move on to the next interesting technology. So I think it's just the fact that the particular project they're working on that's not like an idea that they absolutely want to see the completion and market it's just kind of like a means to an end like i'm using this to learn this project and now i'm bored let me move on to something else 
so Kevin, let's suppose that you start your own, own tech company, your yeah. own startup. What would you, you be your process to bring it on hiring, recruiting software developers? Okay, so like when, when it comes to that, I think it's important to hire based on like the 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 work that they're doing, like the the level of work. Like uh, you know, I, I constantly see like the the requirements ramping up higher and higher and higher and higher for juniors. Um, you're not really gonna like me as a small company. I wouldn't be able to go through ten rounds of interviews with these guys, and you know they pass all 10, 10 rounds. I'm not gonna be able to hire that jun junior. Google will probably hire them for like, you know, more than most seniors are making. So you have to be realistic for one. Okay. Does this guy, does he, is he eager to learn? Is he easy to work with? Has he actually deployed projects? So, you know, does he know the tech stack? You know, you know, just basically can, can he come in and contribute with the oversight of a senior, you know, where you're going to spend most of your time really analyzing who you're bringing on is, is, is your seniors because they're the one that's going to be overlooking all the projects, you know, the team leads and all of that. So if I'm going to ask all the hard questions, it's going to be to them. And, you know, with those guys, you also, beyond the technical part, you have to see their ability to communicate. Like, if they're going to be over your juniors, how, how do they make juniors feel? Because, you know, I know one guy, he left the tech industry because his experience was so bad at his first company, you know what I mean? So like as a senior, if a junior asks you a question, how, how does this guy respond? Does he say, no, go, go, just go look it up. I don't have time for that. Go figure it out. Or does he say, okay, uh, this, this is what you have to do. Let me show you, let me give you an understanding of this. You know, you, you have to have a senior that's willing to teach. Yeah, and, don't, don't be wrong. I think there's a time, every time to say, hey, go figure yourself. But yeah. not, every, not every single time though, not every exactly. single time. Like, like the goal of the seniors to get the, the juniors to a, to a space where they're autonomous. Like the better you teach them, the more autonomous they'll, they'll eventually be. So it's kind of annoying that first when they ask you question after question after question. But, you know, if you give them a good answer, they're not going to ask you that question again because they know what they're doing. I think like where you start saying, hey, man, uh, you need to figure this out is when they ask you the same question over and over. That's like they're not listening. But if it's like a new question, it's like, okay, yeah, let me, let me tell you, you know, because if, if you're the senior, you're ultimately responsible for the project, you, that's your ability to put a stamp on them and get them in alignment with the goals of the project. Yeah, you talked about this earlier. I think a lot of people, like, they don't want to teach their subordinates or junior developers or junior whatever, because like you say, yeah. they're going to take my job. My point of view is like, you should want them to take your job, because that means you train and rub yeah. right. And they should be taking your job, just the same you should be taking your boss's job, right? But some, too many people have the mentality, oh, I'm not going to train them up because they're going to take my job. Well, yeah. you want them to take your job because hopefully you're taking someone else's job, right? Or you're moving right. on to better things. But so many people have that yeah. limited mindset. Yeah, like what people don't understand is that being able to teach and lead, that, that's going to put you in a completely different, like, you know, realm of the company. You know what I mean? If I could get these five juniors, I could teach all of them and get them to come onto one accord to handle this project you know, that's going to possibly put me in a management position, like if that's what you want to do, you know. So, so from your point of view, what are some good characteristics that developers should have and maybe some bad characteristics you notice? Uh, yeah, I have to say good characteristics. Uh, you have to be eager to learn because you, know, you can't coast on knowledge from five years ago in this industry. You know, you, you always have to learn something new. Uh, I think another characteristic is they have to learn how to deal with frustration because there's going to be a lot of problems they don't know how to solve. So do they, you know, freak out and just shut down or do they just keep trying different things over and over until they figure out the solution or do they know how to reach out to the proper party? Um, like, Hey, I don't really know this. Uh, can you help me out? Like, you know, um, I'll say bad characteristics is you don't really want the guy that thinks he knows everything and you don't want the, you know, uh, you know, you know, you, you remember the time when they said, oh, yeah, we want to bring this coding ninja, coding wizard on. Like, uh, honestly, I don't know if you necessarily want to bring that kind of guy into the company because, you know, you don't want a guy that's filling the code base with like weird code. Yeah, he's going to build some all crazy shit. When he leaves, no one's going to know how to do it, right? Exactly. Like, what is this? What is this? What's that? You know, and then. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, if they can't, if nobody can understand the code base, you're going to have to rebuild it. And that's, that's expensive. 
So uh, yeah, you got to find a guy that writes clear, simple, understandable code. That's key because that's maintainable. Like if nobody understands it, that you're welcome to a rewrite of the entire code base. So follow up question. Uh, what is your definition of, of good code? Or what does that even mean? Well, like for me personally, it does the job that it's supposed to do. You know, it's efficient. You know, like when I say it does what it's supposed to do, you 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 say, okay, I want, you know, this to open up and display this. Like it accomplishes the feature that's asked for. And it does it efficiently. It's quick, you know, and it's also easy to understand. Like, you know, you know, it's a good code base when, you know, just you, you just look at the code. Like, oh, okay. Wow. This is simple. This is, I, I understand what's going on. Like, you know, if, if a new developer can read your code and they're like, okay, this is good. Wow. This is simple. You know, to me, that's good code. And, you know, like I mentioned before, you, you want to avoid using weird, like edge case language mechanisms that nobody understands. You want to avoid stuffing technologies in a code base just to stuff it in. Like, oh, this is a hot new library. Let's just bring it in, you know, just because it's new and hot. Like that, that's, that, that creates a bunch of tech depth. You know what I mean? Because, okay, nobody really analyzed this library. You come and find out uh, this library really isn't that good, but we stuffed it in the code base just, you know, so th there's this thing called like resume programming, you know, where you have a developer, he recommends bringing in technologies just because it's new and he wants that on his resume. But does that actually fit the problem domain? Does it effectively solve the problem at hand? You know what I mean? So if he's just bringing in technologies and it doesn't really bring any benefit, you're just adding complexity to the code base. And you know, he, he, has a, he has a better resume, but your code base just became more difficult to understand and therefore now it's more expensive. Kevin, what do you think most people get wrong about having a tech career? Uh, I would say the, the main thing is if you're just here for the money, uh, tech is gonna punish you because uh, it's, you, you constantly have to learn, constantly have to learn. Like I'm on a Saturday reading math books like people might ask me why, because I need to dif differentiate myself, you know, like just the amount of saturation that's coming because everybody wants to be in tech. You have to do something that makes you stand out. You have to do something that's difficult. Like they can't just read, a, uh, you know, watch a course and, you know, two days later have your skill set. So like for me, math, that's, that's something that scares away a lot of people. Like they don't want to dive into a linear algebra, calculus, and all of that stuff. So that's not something they can just pick up immediately. You know, they have to spend years studying that. So, you know, if I get really good at that, my skill set is going to be highly distinctive, you know? And at that point, you can pretty much write your own checks. So, you know, with tech, don't, don't come in here thinking it's like it's an easy way to six figures because you got to work at it. Yeah, I think so many people say, I'll, I'll go to this boot camp for six months and then, you know, yeah. make six figures, you know. I think the mistake, you know, what happened was at one point that was true because, you know, there's one point where companies, they needed a bunch of developers. So the demand for developers outweighed the supply. So, you know, there was a point early, like, you know, five, six, seven years ago, where companies would pretty much pay you to come on and learn. But now there's so many developers, these, these boot camps every year, they're pumping out developers, developers, developers. And there's so many developers and not enough positions. So now when you're coming in, you have to be ready to, ready to go. Like there's no, there's no, uh, let me just sit, sit back and learn. Like, because they have that choice because the, the supply of developers is now outweighing the demand. So, you know, you gotta be good now to get in. <laughs> so Kevin, about how many hours per week do you spend like improving yourself and your craft, like estimate? Like how many hours per week do you spend like making your, your better at your craft? Oh man, I, I spend a lot, man. It just depends on sometimes how I'm feeling though. Like if I'm starting to get burnt out, I'll just do something else until that feeling goes away. So some days I might not study any, but you know, other days I might just do different coding related things or get on a podcast, you know, do, for hours a day. Like uh, something I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to go through this uh, book on 3D math. I'm just reading 10 pages a day, you know, just to keep consistent. The uh, book is about 800 pages long. So I should like around, you know, a couple more months, I should have it done because I'm about 
150 pages in now. So, so Kevin, talk about this. I want to get your opinion on this. Like, there's people mm -hmm. like you, they're working nine to five. They're, yeah. you know, you're doing a podcast, you're improving yourself, you're doing different things. You know, you mm -hmm. have a drive initiative. Other people, they work nine to five and they can't even handle that right. They do nothing else right. Why do some people have like head, quote unquote, have it like you, like make themselves better? Other people like did a set aside and content with doing like bare minimum. Yeah, I think it's, it's just like your core character and what you want. Like, you know, it was hard for me to understand because like, you know, everybody doesn't have the same mentality. Some people just want enough and okay, I'm good. Like uh, I'm making 50,000 is enough to, you know, get, get the food I want, you know, I'm good. But for me, I've always like wanted to like be the best, but you know, I don't necessarily care about being the best anymore, but it's, it's more so about just improving myself. And also, I, you know, I don't know if you ever taken the you know personality test, the Brig, uh, Briggs Meyer personality test. So I kind of have like the, uh, I got the INJ. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a INFJ. Okay, yeah. So like my thing is called like the architect. I like thinking in the future, like what's coming down the pipeline, like how well, what are the trends of the industry. So I realized that, you know, just as the field becomes more and more saturated your skill set has to be higher and higher you gotta you gotta be like you said set yourself apart to be different yeah and i kind of see like other guys they're struggling because they don't improve their skill set they they get stuck on some obsolete technology making 45k or something and the company just keeps them there and it's been an experience of people that don't improve themselves they're the first ones to complain when somebody's doing better than them, right like why did yeah. why did you know kevin get a promotion well because kevin did xyz and you did nothing right yeah exactly and you, you know me like you know even with the podcast man I, I, just just how we mentioned earlier you know you see on youtube guys are literally millionaires off of opening packages i, I can't hate on this it. like ingenious like why did they get that because they put themselves out there they did it like so for me it's like let me do something and put it out there and it could take off yeah and plus you never know like how their background too like on, we're both on tiktok yeah. um do you remember the video that was like hot last year? It was like this, this female. It was like, what can you, what's it was? What's it written free in my head video, right? It like got millions of views, right? And people hate on her. And like people don't realize that's like, that's literally like her, like her 900 videos she did on TikTok, right? So yeah. 900 videos on TikTok blew up and she had to make like lots of money off her, right? And exactly. people hate her, like, this is a bullshit video, blah, blah, blah. No one cares. I mean, she made a lot of money and like, you know, yeah. she even got an NFT from Gary Vaynerchuk off it, but she didn't mm. like, she said, hey, that was actually my 900 video on TikTok. Exactly. So, and people don't see that, you know, you gotta have to be patient, I think. Exactly. And you know what was stopping that the, the so-called hater from putting it out themselves, you know, like that's just jealousy, you know. So yeah, you know, I'm all about trying trying things out and putting it out there because like you know, even on LinkedIn when I told you I got the million point five views, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't expecting that. I just put the stuff out there and for whatever reason it just caught on and blew up. So you yeah. never know. What's gonna blow up? You just gotta put it out it's there. Like one time, I, like last week, I did a I did a poll. I, I have nothing to do with Bitcoin. I was just interested in hearing like, would you would you take your out on Bitcoin? Right? I just I was curious. Mm -hmm. Right? And hey, like it got like thirty thousand views. I think right. And exactly. It just blew me away. Right? What? Yeah. And you never know. Any social media, what's gonna hit? Not hit. Right? It's just it's just it's crazy. A lot of times, the the stuff you don't even really put that much effort in. For some reason, that blows up. Like you know, and you know you, the good thing about blowing up late is like. It, it forces your, your game to be on point so that when you do blow up, you're ready. You don't, you don't fumble the ball. Like the yeah. last thing you ever do is like blow up, but you know, your, your, your production is shoddy. You, you know, you don't have things together because you're going to start losing opportunities when they get presented. So, yeah. I mean, perfect example. So I'm sure you know who like dog face, I think dog face 420 is on TikTok. The yeah, cranberry guy. He did a, he did a song a year ago. Um, so he's the guy he did um he lip synced one of the um Fleetwood Mac songs right on on mm -hmm. uh, and so he's telling the story about it like he's his car had broke down he had to like, do take the stable to work he did the video he was like I'm not gonna post this right yeah he, you know and then that same day he he watched a video from Gary Vaynerchuk and said I have one message for you whatever you video you don't want to post post it right now so he posted yeah. it and talk about life changing for that guy right yeah. I mean like he has to be a millionaire by now. I mean, he blew up. He got he got a branding from Cranberry. He has like his own skateboard brand. I mean, it's this this one 
30 second video, him on a skateboard, yeah. drinking a and grape juice, lip syncing the song. Like, that's, all, that's like, I'm a big fan of TikTok. It's just all it takes, right? And there's so many stories like him, Bella Porch, there's, I mean, there's so many people on there, right? You just, you just never yeah. know what's going to hit, right? Exactly. You got you got to try it out, man. And, you know, I'm almost forced to try it out now because, like, you, you see how inflation is, like, uh, price of houses, okay, yep. it's $400,000 more expensive over the course of a year. Like, you, there's no salary you can make that's going to, you know, cover that. So no. you got to find some kind of business-related, like, entrepreneurial type of opportunity, at least take the chance to look yep. for it. So. And like you, with your post on, on LinkedIn and your podcast, who knows, maybe some code academy might reach out to you. Hey, Kevin, can we sponsor your podcast? You know, I mean, just never know opportunities going to come. Exactly. So exactly. Let, let's go back to um, developers, right? So whether, whatever your, your industry is, whatever it is, software developer, HR, sales, mm. you need to get paid with your value, right? You should get paid with your value, right? Yeah. But I think your problem nowadays is, is a lot of people want to get paid $50 an hour, but they have a $3 mm. an hour work ethic. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Like, somebody, I want to get paid $50 an hour, whatever the case be. Yeah, but, you know, you want to give me $5 of value a, 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 an hour, right? And, like, yeah. you know, example, I use, like, Amazon. If if Amazon pays you $150,000 a year, they expect, like, $300,000 of profit from you, right? They expect to make yeah. it $150,000. You, you, you know, there's no nonprofits out there that's giving you salary just to, you know, feel good yeah, about yourself, yeah. right? That's not the real world. Can you talk about that some? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, people that only have the work ethic, they, they, they get exposed pretty quick in this industry because you can't you can't talk your way out of code like it either works or it doesn't. You know what I mean? I hate deliver this feature. If you don't know what you're doing. You're not going to be able to deliver that feature. Um, you know, the reason that a lot of people, uh, you know, you know, these companies start doing the video interviews was because uh, when a lot of these people were being interviewed to do these like coding assignments, they get you know, somebody that's in the industry to do it for them. So now you got to get on video and do live coding. And, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get exposed right then and there. Um, and this, this isn't the industry for people who have weak work ethics and who don't know what they're doing. Uh, you, you, get, you, get, you get fired pretty quickly, you know, if you can even make it in the door in the first place. Um, yeah, in regards to getting where you're worth, is, it, 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 just, it just goes along with life. Like, I think that the problem is nowadays we're kind of taught this idealized thing that, okay, you do a good job, somebody's just going to pay you what your so-called worth, but you get paid what you negotiate for as well, you know? So if you, if you have a good skill set and you can't negotiate, you're going to get underpaid. So it's, it's a combination of knowing you're having a good skill set and being able to negotiate. If you don't have the skill set, you're not going to last long in the industry. If you don't have the ability to negotiate, you're just going to be underpaid. So did that answer your question? Or yeah, it did. You... Yeah, it, it did. Okay. Yeah, it did. So why did you, so you have your podcast too. Yeah. What's the reason for doing the podcast? Well, me and one of my other friends, uh, his name is Brian, man, we just had these conversations on the phone. I'm like, man, this is good stuff, like good information. Like people need to hear this. Uh, why, why not just, uh, you know, let's, let's just do a podcast. And, you know, he had other things going on. So, you know, me and uh, Terrence, who's a podcast co-host, we decided to just run with it. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's also like a good way to decompress because like a lot of times after you spend coding all day, it gives you a headache. You don't want to do more coding at the work. So you need kind of to do something different to kind of decompress. And, you know, uh, you know, in this industry, it's kind of isolated coding. is kind of like an isolated thing. Like you're staring at a computer all day. You're not necessarily talking to people. So if you're, you you whatever skills you use over and over, that skill gets better. So if you're just not talking to people, your social skills start kind of getting stunted. You know what I mean? So part of the reason for doing the podcast was just like to improve our speaking abilities. Like, you know, when you get on the interview, you have to be able to eloquently talk about the solution. You can't just be like, uh, mm, I, I kind of <laughs> think this and that, you know what I mean? Like, they're going to look at you like, uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So, you know, that and kind of like what we mentioned before, man, you just got to put yourself out there. You got to take an entrepreneurial opportunity. Why not? You know, like I got you just be sitting playing video games after work and just being stagnant. So why not at least 
try to build an audience and see if I can turn that into, you know, a, a business opportunity. So, Kevin, you might not know this, but do you have to know the percentage of software developers who suffer from like corporal syndrome? Things what's called corporal syndrome, where you like your wrist get messed up from talking mm -hmm. too much. You, you, you don't have to know that, do you? Oh, thank God I never had that. But, but is, is that a problem that you notice with developers uh, having stuff like that? Uh, I guess like most of the coders I know, they're they're probably like 40 and younger. So okay. I have yeah. But yeah, I'll go, going back to the uh, other podcast, uh, the, the question about why I started the podcast too, like, you know, I'm half black, half Korean. And honestly, like, can you think about any, you know, you have that uh, Marquise Brownlee, you know, he, but he, his stuff is like generally tech, but do you know like any black, uh, coding related podcasts or YouTube channels. It's not that many. Yeah, I know a few. There's a Caleb King. I know him. You, yeah, of course. I, I, I mean, maybe five of the most. Yeah. But you know, there's like way more like hip hop, rap. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That kind of stuff. I'm kind yeah. of like, uh, you know, or like, you know, oh, oh, selling shoes or, or yeah. video games or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So, like, you know, there's like, let's, let's give the, let's give the community something else that they can like, you know, if they see somebody that's kind of like them that's in the industry, maybe they think, oh, I can do this too, you know, as opposed to, oh yeah, let's just, let's just uh, watch a, a podcast about rap and, you know, these guys fighting or something like, it, it, I don't know, it's just hard to find like content outside of entertainment, you know? Yeah. So Kevin, next talk some about diversity and tech, right? So yeah. I, I've, been, I've been involved in tech since like 2014, 2015, right? Mm. From my point of view, it doesn't like anything's gotten better. I could be wrong, of course, but it's like always talk about diversity, this, tech numbers, this. Yeah, yeah. It just doesn't seem like the numbers are getting any better, right? It's just like the same thing over and over again, right? What's, yeah. what's your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I, like, the thing with tech is like either you know how to do the job or you don't. Like you can't just... It's more like travel. a... Record. More like a what's it called meritocracy with meritocracy. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. You, can't you, do it, you can't. Mm -hmm. You can't bring a guy off the street. And say, hey, right, here, here, just, you just figure it out because he's not going to be productive. He has to either know what he's doing or he doesn't. So, you know, I think that's kind of like you know with the podcast. It's like I want to showcase that hey, you can do it, but you have to put in the effort. Like nobody can baby you in and just give you a job because you have to learn on your own how to do it you know but yeah i don't i don't think companies are are able to afford bringing on people that don't know how to do the job you know what i mean so that's that's the um that's the hard thing about improving those so-called diversity numbers and i know you know it's not all that diverse when it comes to certain ethnicities like i'm usually the only black guy you know maybe on the whole tech you know the like at my current company, I know like one one other black guy in the whole like company that does tech, you know? So it's not a bunch, but in order to increase the numbers, you know, you got to kind of uh, at least say, hey, you can do it, but you got to be willing to put in the effort. So I think that's kind of like the hard part. If they want to improve the numbers, how do they, uh, find the people who, who want to learn this, you know? And so here's a question for you. So you're in the Dallas area. Dallas is, is pretty known for tech. Like Dallas, downtown yeah. Dallas, playing a lot of tech people. Mm. And those who are not from Dallas, South Dallas is kind of like, you know, like the, the um, poor place, you know, more, yeah. you know, I won't say downtown, but like less access to, to resources, right? Yeah, yeah. So this place is a tech company in downtown Dallas. They want to recruit, like, you know, diverse talent, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it their responsibility to go to South Dallas and find the talent, or should the people of South Dallas go to the tech people? Like cause most tech companies, I heard of that meetups have you know networking groups. Mm -hmm. So the tech company be going down to where the talent is, diverse talent, or is the response of diverse talent go to the tech people? Um, I would say they kind of have to meet in the middle. You know, like if the the kids or you know the people in South Dallas they don't even know about these opportunities, they can't be like, hey, uh, you know, bring us in. But, you know, the companies can't bring in somebody that doesn't really have the desire to be there. You know what I mean? Like certain jobs, you can kind of bring people on and let them learn on a job. You know what I mean? But with programming, you can't. Yeah, I think a lot of tech people would say, well, if they really wanted to find a job, they saw an initiative, they find a way there. But then again, like, mm -hmm. can they really get there? You know, like, you know, yeah. they don't have a car 
or maybe the bus that or dart is mm. too dangerous, right? You know. Yeah. And, and then again, I think a lot of people, you know, in like the unrepresented areas, like you know, they're like, okay, they should be coming to us. Well, no yeah. one's gonna come to you in life, right? And give you an opportunity. You gotta go fight for it. Yeah. I think, you know. So I definitely exactly. have to be some kind of common ground. Exactly. Um, I think you know, it's it's just an exposure thing. Like you know, we could find all kinds of like on YouTube. You know, when it comes to black entertainment, we could find all kinds of stuff about you know sports, music, etc. But what's gonna uh, get grab that kid's interest over there? Um, you know, make him want to join tech. You know, the, the interesting thing that I heard. Um, one of my it's like my uh, cousins, her daughter, she's like 16. She said, oh, I want to grow up to be a coder. And that's, that was kind of like unheard of, like from, you know, a young black girl, you know, like when I grew up, I, I never knew a black woman that just say, hey, I want to be a coder. But so to hear her say it, it's kind of becoming like more in vogue now. So like with what I'm trying to do with the podcast is trying to showcase like, hey, I look like you, I'm, I'm not smarter than you. I just went out and got it and you could get it too, you know? And, uh, you know, these kids, they, they have to see someone else that's doing it. And I can kind of point them towards resources. Like literally everything you need to do to start coding is free. So what's stopping you, you know? Yeah. And, and, and age doesn't matter, right? You can be 80 years old or eight years old coding. Yeah. Cause um, I was on a, um, I never go on Clubhouse anymore, but last week I just happened to go there to say, oh, let me see what's on there. Yeah. And there's like tech conversation and there's an 11 year old kid on there talking about how you learn to code, how he coded his own NFT. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it looked like, it looked like basically what it said, like, you, you, you missed me, right? There's no way you're 11. Like, no, yes, I'm 11. I promise I'm 11. I did this right. Like yeah. he's 11. He, you tell like a young kid, right? Young boy, right? Yeah. He said, I just learned a year ago and like he just broke down everything he can. Like, if you're like, we would hire you right now if your parents let us, right? And so age should not be a limit. Like it's same like, you know, on YouTube a while ago on a, I think it was a Python channel. And this person 75 years old said, Hey, I'm 75. Uh, I started learning Python three years ago. You know, I just do it for yeah. fun. Right. I'm not trying to make money. You know, I just do it. Right. I mean, yeah. I think code is one of the, one of the few professions that it doesn't matter how smart you are, how old, old you are, how young mm -hmm. you just have to be able to do the job. And yeah, I think you have, of course, like some kind of patience, you have some skill to it, of course, but like, yeah, it's like, if you want to make money, code is, I think, one of the best ways to go, I think, from my opinion. And, you know, even if a company doesn't hire you, you can freelance and build your own applications. Like, all of these kids have phones. The phones have software on it. Like, you know, they're using TikTok, et cetera, as software. Like, why not build your own app? You know what I mean? It's, it's one of the amazing things about the software industry is, one, just about everything you need to know is free. You can get a free version of it. You can get VS code for free. You can get courses for free. You know what I mean? It, these The resources are free. And two, people are actually willing to help you out. Like, you know, a lot of other industries, you probably can't just reach out to some guy and he'll literally show you how to do the job with the software. You know, if you get a good mentor, he'll say, hey, uh, you know, come, come work with me on this code base. I'll show you how to, you know, integrate and be. Because I remember even at one point, you know, you were bringing on like junior guys to work on your application. They had a senior guy watching over them. You know what I mean? Like free, free, percentage of free internship. Like there's yep. so many free opportunities and to learn. You just got to go get it, you know? Yeah. Like I have a, I know a person, I LA this female. She's 23 now. She just graduated college. Yeah. But if she was 70, if she was 16, she made an app. And what the app would do, you, you would like, Take the app and go into your closet and match mm -hmm. what you should wear that day, right? And mm -hmm. she's 16, she built like you're 16, but I have to like, match his clothes. Like, and maybe it's not as big a deal as I think it think it is, but like I just blew my mind away. Like, you did that at 16. Yeah, she showed it to me. Like, yeah, you just do a quick scan of the clothes and I go, wear this, wear this, wear this, like instantly, right? Yeah, yeah. Man, it's man, it's, it's, it's like so many amazing opportunities out there, man. People just gotta jump on it. Like it's not there's literally nothing stopping them, you know. Like it's not it's not somebody that's blocking them from a computer. Say, hey, no, you can't you can't get on this. Like, you can literally if you have to, you can code on your phone. You know. I know. So talk about this and just talk about females in tech for a minute. And so I don't know where the stat is, but I know I've seen it. You know, because I've referenced several times. So I'm, I'm kind of making the numbers up. You get the idea. So when a, when a female is like in the fifth or sixth grade, eighty percent of them are interested in STEM, high mm -hmm. number. 
by the time they graduate, only 10 to 50% of their interest in STEM. What happens from six to 12th grade that makes like 70% of females like, I don't do STEM anymore. Is it societal pressures or like, it's too, I mean, it's like, what is, it? I'm doing, I mean, I'm sure it's hard and all, but like, why is those numbers drop down so much? And, and, uh, and, and, and males can stay the same. Don't want to get males drop down some, but not like 70%. I mean, I, I can't really speak for the current generation, but I know like during my generation, coding wasn't looked at as sexy. It wasn't looked at as fun. It looked at it as nerds. Like, what, what was that show? Freaks and Geeks. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Pretty much what a coder would look at. Oh, is this nerdy dude, you know, in, probably in his mom's basement playing video games and Dungeons and Dragons. That was a, like a coder. Like, like, like somebody people. 40 years old still in the basement of mom's house, you know. Yeah. Eating Doritos and smoking dope, you know. And <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the maybe these girls are not seeing other women that are coders and say, Hey, I really want to do. I this. think that's a big thing right there. Yeah. Or, you know, it, 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 here's the thing. Like why, why does every industry have to be 50% this 50% that's not realistic. Maybe some women just, maybe that's just not what they want to do. You know what I mean? Maybe because coding is kind of an isolated thing. You know, you have to have a certain type of personality to really even want to be in this industry. So, you know, maybe some of these women prefer something more social and there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like we could say, why, why aren't there more men in nursing? Maybe they just don't want to be there. Yeah, I think there's a point. You know, I think too many of us were like, we need X amount of this here or X amount of that here. Like, like no, I don't think it works like that, you know? Exactly. And like you're right, back in the day, like, you know, you're a man nurse. Like, what's wrong with you, right? You know, are you kind of funny or whatever? You know, like, you're not a real man. You're like, you're a nurse. Like, you know? Exactly. But now it's more so, common. Yeah. So, you know, at the, at the most, like society could just showcase more women that are coders and say, this is cool things you can make, but we can't say, okay, we need 50% women in the industry. Like you can't just shoehorn people into places they don't want to be at because it's, it's not going to work, you know? Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. So next um, uh, question I follow on LinkedIn. I think you just did this post yesterday, or I don't, actually, I don't know when you did the post. But you yeah. did the post where you basically said, is, is software development or, or coders or programmers, are we the only industry that talks about depression so much? Like, why do we talk about depression so much? Do other industries talk about this? Can you talk about yeah. coding? I mean, Cause I know there's in, in the in entrepreneur startups, a lot of talking about startup depression, founder depression, you know, mm -hmm. no one really talks about it. Can you talk to some about like the back, why you made that post and your thought process about it? Cause like, you know, I kind of think man, you, you hear a lot of the, the coders talk about, you know, mental health and burning out and this and that. You notice like a lot of programmers that get older, they start getting burnt out. Like, you know, I talked to some of my, uh, one of my coder friends, he's been in the industry a couple years longer than me. He's starting to get into trucking because he's kind of burnt out on just coding. Like, why are so many people getting burnt out? And, uh, you know, even in the video game industry, like they used to have these coders uh, work all day and then they sleep under their desk and they come back you know, they don't, they don't ever leave the building. It's like, they're just literally there in the building. All I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a Google model, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much why the campus is so good. They don't want you to leave. So it's like, you know, what, what, what is the ultimate purpose? Like, you can't have a life, you know, like, <laughs> you know, even I feel burnt out, you know, sometimes it's kind of like well, I'm starting to do other things like a podcast. Like, I love coding, but I don't know if I want to, the industry, the higher up you get, the more responsibilities you get, it's, it starts wearing on you mentally, you know? Like, okay, say you work at this big company, it's Friday night and, you know, it's deployment night for whatever reason, this function isn't working and people can't buy a product. Your senior guy, guess, what, guess who's going to get that call at like, you know, seven, eight at night. You're going to have to stop everything you're doing, get to a computer fix the problem where the company's losing millions of dollars, you know, it's like, that's, that's a lot of pressure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and those instances, I, I think if you're, if you're a bad company, you would have like everyone working nine to five, you're never going to leave. Right. And then yeah. still make your people do that kind of stuff. You're a good company. Well, back then we were like, Hey, you know, software coders come, Hey, you know, can I have like four hours off tomorrow? Go see my son play basketball. Back then we would say, no, you need a code. Cause this is going on. Yeah. A good company would say, you know what, go see, see your son's basketball game because, in the future, when something bad happens, I, I need to call you at two in the morning and I can have a good conscience calling you at two in the morning knowing I'll let you take yeah. time off for your family, right? 
Exactly. Like, um, you know, like, and plus, like, it almost feels like you're a slave of the computer because, you know, like we mentioned, if your skills aren't up to par, are you not being competitive? Everybody else is studying. So if you're not studying, it feels like, okay, I'm starting to become obsolete. You know, I don't have the, the newest technology. I don't have the right frameworks. Because, you know, one thing a lot of people don't realize is if you bet on the wrong set of frameworks, uh, you just wasted a lot of time because you can't find a job. Say, for example, you know, uh, React is a sexy JavaScript framework now. And, you know, most of the big jobs that I see, they're asking for React, but I'm primarily Angular, you know? So just from that alone, you know, it's, I miss out on job opportunities. So, you know, it's, 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 a lot, it's a lot of pressure in the industry. Like you got to bet right, you have to work hard. And, you know, if you bet wrong, you, you spent a lot of effort on learning something that, you know, is not gonna help you progress. So, I have to imagine there's a lot of pressure for when someone picks their first coding language, right? Because they have yeah. to get it right, sort of, kind of right. You, can you remember Ruby on Rails? That was the, the real hot thing at one yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. That's the sexy uh, thing back in the day. Now it's like almost legacy technology, and it was just that quick. Yeah. Um, so what new tech out there excites you? Uh, you, so I mentioned I'm getting into math. I kind of like, I want to get into like the, the 3D space, you know, game programming. That's, so I don't necessarily want to be in the game programming industry because I heard like, you know, this, the, the work conditions there are pretty bad, but you know, what a lot of companies are moving towards is the metaverse and, you know, gaming pretty much has had the metaverse before the metaverse. They had like Second Life, PlayStation Home. So all these other companies are starting to catch on to that. And you, the reason I've heard Microsoft bought Activision Blizzard, it wasn't to compete against Sony. It was to compete, you know, to prevent Facebook, Google, Amazon from buying them and get into that space. Like, you know, the metaverse, that's the next big frontier. That's where people are, you know, the next big fortunes are gonna be made. Like whoever owns the, the servers where you log into the so-called metaverse, they're gonna make, a ton of money because people are buying digital land in their metaverse. You know what I mean? So I know Microsoft, they probably want to own that just like Facebook wants to own that. So having the skills, 3D skills, you know, that, that's, you're going to pretty much be able to write your own check. And that's not, that's not an easy uh, skill set to pick up. It's like a lot of intense mathematics. So, you know, that's kind of like, where I'm positioning my skill set. And, you know, I've always liked video games, so I can use that same skill set to make games on my own time. Kevin, your podcast, is it, is, is, is it like a, you and your co-host talking? Yeah. You, you, ever, you ever have guests on there? You, you are, gonna, are you going to bring on guests later on? Uh, yeah, occasionally we have uh, our friend Brian. He comes on. He's a fellow coder. Uh, we just had like our first interview the other day. But uh, yeah, I think what we wanted to do before we really started hammering out the interviews was uh, getting everything set up and looking good. Like he recently uh, upgraded his camera. We both have the Sony ZV-1. So, you know, now our podcast looks a lot better. Yeah. Yeah, those cameras make a difference. Like if you go my first podcast, I had like a webcam, like yeah. a basic BS microphone. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, even like, even like going for like a, I have a Mac, even going from like the FaceTime internal camera on the MacBook to a webcam, I'm, the difference is unbelievable, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not even close, right? And then I could actually get a real camera, yes, yeah, like or a microphone, yeah, it's, it's a big difference. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to, uh, you know, advertise your show and actually get on guests if, you know, your, your production looks kind of low quality. So we kind of have to upgrade our setup before we really started uh, pushing it. Yeah. And y'all do the podcast at your house or your friend's house? Uh, we actually using, uh, like, I think it's like Melon streaming app. To, okay. Because you know, he's in LA. So, okay. Yeah. So it's like a split screen thing. I'm on one side, he's on the other side. Okay. So different locations. Yeah. So, so what's your vision for your career? Like, is your vision like become the CTO of Microsoft, Amazon to become, you know, like your own startup founder or like just go up through the, the corporate realm and like do general you know, software over time? Like, what's your vision for yourself? looking uh, down probably, in the future. So probably doing something entrepreneurial, like, uh, you know, I'm hoping, you know, social media thing blows up, the podcast blows up. Like, I don't ever want to give up coding. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if that blows up, I'm still be coding, probably still working at some company. But, 
you know, I just want to be able to utilize the social media and, you know, you pull in millions from that. And, you know, the, I think what I really want most, I don't, I don't need to be like, I have a hundred million dollars or something. I just want enough, you know, enough money to where I have freedom. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't feel like working tomorrow. So I'm going to just take tomorrow off. You know what? That's a good point too. Like if you're a developer, developing is on a few jobs you can have that can you do it anywhere in the world, right? Exactly. You can be on the beach in Hawaii. You can be, you know, somewhere in the Brazil or Czechoslovakia, you know, as long as you have a good Wi-Fi hospital case, you can do your job anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that freedom, man, uh, it's, it's unbeatable, you know, like, to do, you know what I'm saying? I've worked hard my whole life, man. I don't, I don't necessarily want to be like a corporate slave forever to where like, man, I'm 60. I find I can finally enjoy life. You know what I mean? But yeah, well, yeah I was saying, you know, you work 45 years at company, retired, and then have 10 years of life left, you know? And exactly. then by that time, can you really enjoy it, right? You know, you know, yeah. you're 60, you're probably broken down, you know, bad back, whatever. Can you like travel, you know, do stuff, right? You probably have bad health, right? So then you just watching TV every day, right? Why not exactly. enjoy it where you can? Yeah, so you know, so I want to be able to get that money and enjoy it, you know, before I get too old, so. Um, so I, I don't necessarily want to be like the CEO of a big company because you pretty much become a slave to that company. Mm -hmm. Like your life revolves around that. But, uh, you know, I see people are making decent money off of like YouTube and this and that, so. Uh, or continue my coding, coding related endeavors, but, you know, kind of like utilize that money as well to uh, pretty much, I guess, buy my freedom, you know, like free up my time to do what I want to do. Like I'll probably be programming games instead of, you know, another CRUD application, another forms base, fill out this form, mm -hmm. send a reply to the database. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think there's never been a better opportunity for people to make money that isn't our right. Exactly. Like, I, you know, I see a lot of posts, people talking about, okay, they made six figures off of LinkedIn. They made eight figures off of, uh, uh, what is it, Twitter. You know what I mean? Like, how are they doing that? Why, why, why not look into that? Yeah. So, Kevin, next. So, what's something that you don't like about, you do not like about the tech industry? I mean, I would say it's the, the constant grind and it's, it's not really stable, man. Like. Um, if you know, you know, how I mentioned before, if you bet on the wrong set of technologies, you just became deprecated. You're, you're working, working on legacy projects and, uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the constant grind, you have to learn, 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 learn something new. You can't just learn something like two years ago and just, okay, I got my free time. Mm -hmm. No, it's more like, okay, no, I got to learn this new framework after work. I got to learn this new you know it's just constant learning constant grinding and uh you know the, the interviews are becoming harder and harder so you got to prepare for that as well so you know this, this is the industry that can burn you out so you know you got to kind of like man, manage your mentality if you don't want to get burnt out and that's like really what i don't like about the industry like i love coding but I don't like being forced to spend like nearly all of my free time, you know, learning coding stuff I may not want to learn. You know, why can't I just make a project I want to make? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And another stuff, I think a lot of people like they'll get confused by work life balance. People say, well, I'm not going to do this. I want work life balance. I mean, you think about this only life now, right? Because the working life is so interchangeable, right? We're on call 24 7 pretty much, right? You got to be responsive, you know? Yeah. So, so Kevin, next. What's your take on this? Let's suppose the developers lucky enough to get an offer from a big company like a Google and a startup. Yeah. So either Google getting paid one hundred fifty thousand a year, probably two hundred thousand a year, or a startup has funding, right? Because mm -hmm. of course, you know, most startups have no funding. That'd be no pay. What What would you, what do you recommend? Going to go go going to Google making two hundred thousand a year, or going to startups with funding maybe get only paid one hundred thousand a year but get equity? What's your take on both of those situations or, or opportunities? Uh, man, honestly, I'll probably go with the Google offer because, you know, once, once you get in at Google, you know, you you pretty much write your own checks afterwards. Like you see a lot of X, X Google, X yeah. Facebook, this and that, whatever. They just have tons of, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers just based off of that. Yeah. Like they, they can create their own entrepreneurial opportunity 
with the startup, yeah, you know, the company could blow up, but it might not. So yeah. what if it doesn't? You, you're like, oh man, I should have went with Google. So what's your take on, if you work for Google, you'll probably be only doing like maybe one small thing. But if you go to a startup, you might be doing everything color related. Well, how about that, that, um, that point? Mm, I, would, I would still say, go with Google for a year. And then if you want to work for a startup after that, then you can go, you know, like. Get, you're probably, get probably, your, yeah, probably easy to get hired, right? Because you're ex-Google, right? Yeah, exactly. Like get that on your resume. You pretty much go from there. So from your point of view, what are a lot of junior developers getting wrong about the job search process? Uh, I think they're, they think it's just based off of skills. It's not. Like I keep telling telling them like visibility, visibility. Yeah, visibility. basically no job nowadays. I don't care what your career field is. HR, sales, marketing, yeah. truck driver, nothing's just based on your skills anymore. They, they you know, they, they want to know your story. Like uh, a, lot, a lot of junior developers, they get reached out to because they say, oh, I used to work at McDonald's and, you know, I taught myself to code and, you know, somebody sees him and says, oh, okay, this guy works hard. Let me, let me talk yeah, to him. He, they, have some, they have some initiative. Exactly. Like, uh, you know, they're, 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 what, what junior developers have to realize is like thousands of you competing for the same position. So, you know, if you have a thousand of a similar looking item, you're going to look for something that looks different. What makes you look different from the masses? You know what I mean? Uh, unless you're just like supremely skilled, you know, it's going to be hard to distinguish yourself from the, the standpoint of being skilled. Yeah, so uh, you unless to, unless you build an app that killed death, you know, it's going to be kind of hard, like, you know, put yourself apart from everyone else. Exactly. So it's like you, you have to maybe start a YouTube channel, a blog or something to where they look at that and say, oh, OK, this, this is interesting. Like nobody else is doing this. So, yeah, what I, what I tell people the time the job search, I don't remember what the job search is. Like I always tell them, if you're going to do a job search, start a blog, right? And like document what you're doing, like. Today I did this. Tomorrow I did this, right? Yeah. And so people look back at your history. Like, okay, they've been grinding it out. They're they're actually you know trying and they're doing stuff, right? I think this makes you yeah. more personable too, right? Yeah, but you know the thing thing people have to realize is nobody knows what you're doing unless you advertise it, like you showcase it in some form or fashion. So you could be like the hardest worker ever, but if you don't write about it, if you don't showcase your project, you're just like the guy who who does nothing, you know? Yeah. And there's some people out there know you shouldn't do that because, you know, you're being egotistical, you, you know, you're being prideful, whatever. But I mean, like you said, it's a game we got to play nowadays, right? You got to put yeah. yourself out there and tell people what you're doing. You know, people, exactly. people want to know your story. Everyone has an interest in story. Put yours out there. Exactly. And, you know, like what I found is you just got to learn to tune those voices out. Like those people, they, they're not paying your bills. So who cares what they think? You know what I mean? Like. You got to do what's, what's best for you and your family. And, you know, to me, like, uh, egotistical is like you saying, oh, man, I'm so good. Like, I'm amazing. Or, you know, you just showcasing your project. That's not really egotistical. That's just, like, interesting. Like, oh, he's making a cool project. You know what I mean? Like, people like seeing stuff like that. Yeah. And for the stuff I do, like, always made me, like, out of the blue, someone to reach out. Hey, Jason, ain't, ain't talked to you a while, but I really enjoy your post, right? I'm like, first of all, I had no idea we were freaking licking my stuff, right? Yeah. So that, that always blows me away. And then back, we talked earlier about you know, asking for help on LinkedIn. It's been my experience, like, I'm kind of making up, like, every 10 people ask for help, at least eight say yes, right? So yeah. I would definitely advise people to ask for help, right? Of course, one out of 100 going to be a jerky boy and jackass and, like, you know, be yeah. just a jackass. But more often than not, they're going to, like, help you out. And maybe they, they don't help you right then. They might say, hey, follow up with me next month. Or, hey, I can't do this. We know around, but I'm going to introduce you to, you know, Bob, Jane, and Susan, right? Like, yeah. what, what's the saying the hungry mouth don't get fed and um exactly you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take you, you got to ask for help right you got to ask for it yeah man, that, that was my biggest problem in the, my earlier days i you know like scared like somebody's gonna say something mean or something but yeah. i found of course, that you know, yeah of course don't be spammy about it no stalk you know just be yeah. really nice you know you know respectful you know yeah, like as long as you're not being annoying, like you know, like every single thing, it's like you redirecting a conversation to you or your product, like hijacking conversations and all of that kind of stuff. As long as you're respectful, people like seeing you posting your thoughts or what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So, Kevin, um, we talk about some of my social media, and you mm -hmm. and you do a lot of posts on LinkedIn and TikTok. Yeah. What What makes TikTok so fun for you? What 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 do you enjoy about TikTok? What makes uh, that go to as a backup to LinkedIn? 
I think like with TikTok, you can at least get, you know, get views because, uh, you know, it, it kind of sucks that, you know, you put an effort into something and nobody watches. It's like you're just talking to yourself or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. So with TikTok, at least you can get views. And two, it's, it's really simple. Like they may, they probably have the best interface for loading, uploading videos. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, man, it's, it's so, it's just great. Whoever did that, like, deserves a medal or something. Yeah, it is ingenious. You just make a short three minute clip, talk, hit, you know, maybe put a little text thing above it and upload and it's, it's, it's up there. So, you know, you, you can reach a lot of people. TikTok, I believe that's the most popular social media platform. Yeah. Now. You reach a lot of people and you don't have to spend a lot of time fighting to upload your video. Yeah, so. and I think it's pretty much known like on Facebook, and Instagram, like, you know, even with paid ads, you're not gonna see anyone, right? It's so set up, you know, it's yeah. no one's gonna see it, right? Where TikTok, I mean, like we talked before, I've had videos on TikTok only like four or five views. Other ones have, you know, a couple thousand views, right? Yeah, exactly. Where Facebook, Instagram, yeah, you're not getting nothing on Instagram unless you're like an influencer or a known brand, like, you know, yeah. Kanye West or like McDonald's, you know, or paying big money for ads, you know, it's. It's like, uh, you know, like YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all, all of those are pretty much shut out. Like, unless you got in early, like you said, you're a big influencer. Yeah. Nobody's going to see your stuff, so. Yeah, I definitely think, like we said, pre-talk LinkedIn and TikTok are pretty much still the water wild west, so to speak, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the people that get in early here before they start shutting the gates, they're going to be good. So I'm kind of trying to, you know, get in before it closes, so to say. Yeah. So, Kevin, are there any, like, um, well, or any software developer people that you follow or that, like, a mentor to you that you, like, go to or advice you just follow in general? Um, I follow, like, a ton of them. Like, you know, if they have an interesting post on LinkedIn, uh, pretty much end up following them. Like, uh, I can't really think of anyone in particular. I just kind of like, kind of, if they, they, they post something interesting, I usually just give them a follow. Nice. So back to the junior developers. What's your advice for junior developers to make themselves like more what they're working for? Not like more career ready, more mm -hmm. ready to like, you know, fight the process of, you know, hey, I got to, I, I pretty much got to battle a thousand other developers. I got to be competitive. Yeah. What's your advice on that? Well, I think one of the keys is uh, you have to carefully define where, what, what aspect of software you want to be in. You know what I mean? And from there, that's, that's how you can make like a laser sharp program. You don't want to just be bouncing around from this to this to this to this because you're not really becoming confident. Like for junior developers, honestly, they need to just pick one language and stick with it. They don't need like five different languages they're dabbling with. You're just wasting your time doing that. Like pick one language. Okay, you say, okay, I want to be a web developer, front end, learn JavaScript, stick with that, get really good, master that. Like, you know, and I would say, you know, pe people need to refine their focus. Like, you're a junior developer, but you come out of boot camp saying you're full stack. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, the problem with that is, like, you're opening yourself up to a lot more questions. Like, uh, you go to an interview, I'm a full stack. Guy. They're gonna, they can ask you about SQL. No SQL, authentication, authorization. That's just the back end stuff. Now you got the front end stuff, you know, Webpack, Angular, NGRX, you know. So, and they're like, well, my bootcamp told me to say front end developer. That's what I did. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, but what people have to realize is their resume is it's not like a, like a police report. You don't have to write down every single thing you touched mm -hmm. and when. Pick, pick the technology. It's, high, it's a highlight reel. Like, Okay, do you want to be a basketball player? You want to be a football player? You can't you can't list like everything. Yeah, I want to be a football player and I'm gonna focus on football. I want to be a JavaScript developer, I'm gonna just focus on and JavaScript. they find even more. You want to be a football player, you want to be the quarterback, the running back, the, yep. the X, the slot, you know, the you know, the cover one, yeah. you know, all that kind of you know what exactly you want to be. You got a niche down, like right. Exactly. So like kind of like find that niche and then become the master of it and that's how you stand out like you don't want to be that generalist who's oh i'm okay at everything like why would they want to pick you over that guy who's like the best css html javascript guy you know that they've seen so kevin what's the process for going from a junior to senior developers like is that something you, you decide on your own like, oh, i'm a senior developer now is some kind of internal test you take somewhere does your company decide that how do you go from being a junior to a senior developer Honestly, I kind of think that's an arbitrary term. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like, okay, now I'm a senior developer. It's just like if the company that you get hired at 
says, okay, you're a senior, then you pretty much considered a senior. Like after two years in the industry, I was considered a, you know, a senior at at and But, you know, the one of the ways that kind of fast tracked me is like when I started working, uh, Angler, you know, two or whatever, it was in beta. So, you know, I started working with that since it was in beta. So once I got my second job, you know, people who've been there for five, six, seven years programming, they didn't have more experience than me in Angular. So, you know, I, I was almost like a go-to guy because I worked at worked with this technology since I was so young. So um, that kind of made me like a, almost like, a, I want to say authority, but like a go-to guy when an Angular problem comes up or oh, ask Kevin, you know, so that's how I was able to kind of like fast track the senior, but like, after two years, if you're really good at what you're doing, you probably get a senior role somewhere at a company. Does something come after senior developer? Is like another title after that? Um, you know, usually like a team lead or you can move into like architect, or, you know, or some people just get out of code and they, they you know, they get into management. But uh, I think I'm probably going to stick with like, you know, stay in the coding realm. I actually like having my hands on the code. Is there a certain language out there you, you want to learn that you haven't done yet? Uh, I, I was playing around with C Sharp, but I'm kind of to the point where uh, I just made a decision. I mean, let me just stick with TypeScript. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm more focused now on actually building something than just playing around with languages. Like, I want to build like a game or something, you know, like language is kind of like secondary. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not too focused on like learning a new language. Okay. So Kevin, talk about this, and I can't think of a term. Like suppose like mm -hmm. you're, you're coding, right? Yeah. And and like people don't realize that like one simple web page, you might take like like page and page of code, right? Mm -hmm. And like you might do the code, and then you have a bug. You might be, maybe appears to be a be a apostrophe or big capital T should be a little s. What what's the process for going through there? I think it's called quality assurance or something like that. Think about that process. How coders got to go through and like like painstakingly go in detail and find the mistakes they made and how that's not, that's not an easy process. A lot of, a lot of tech people are like, well, hey, you coded it. It should be simple to do this like in, in a few minutes, right? Can you talk about the actual, the painstakingly detailed process of code, like, you know, find your mistakes, find your bugs, all that kind of stuff. So like, you know, that, that kind of error, that's a syntax error and that gotta be caught like, you know, by your IDE or whatever, like uh, say you're doing Angular, you're running the Angular CLI, you type a little error then you save it, then you'll see at the bottom, oh, oh, it's red down there. So there's an error. So they'll tell you the line that you made the error on. Uh, you know, where quality, you know, the QA team, where they really come in is your code doesn't have sy syntax errors. It's more so like a functional error. Like you expect this nav bar to do this, but it's doing something else. Mm -hmm. So like, that's where they'll discover uh, the issues you make. Uh, but in terms of like, uh, syntax errors your IDE should uh, find that but like it, the functional errors is where like it gets it gets like more difficult like why is this nav bar acting weird you know uh, why isn't this pop up popping up when it should and you know the the process of that is usually inspecting and looking at the logs and you know it, it It'll generally tell you like the area of where you know the function messed up. Sometimes, do you have any plans? Any interest in being like a product manager? Uh, no, I don't, I don't. You know that those those kind of roles kind of get you away from the code. I don't really. You, so know, you want to like, stay hands on coding then? Yeah, because I actually enjoy building stuff. I don't. You know, like when you're managing, it's more like just dealing with people. Hey, everybody, what are you doing? When is when when is this available? Like, I don't really want to. Uh, you know, plus they, they have to deal with business more like, you know, mm -hmm. why is this product ready? You know, you said it would be ready, you know, they get yelled at and all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm not too into that. <laughs> so, um, what's your, so of course, you know, remote work's a big thing now, you know, with all, all the COVID stuff going on. Yeah. So for you, what's your take on this, right? Because I'm a believer, a lot of people are not good at remote work, right? Like me, I'm not good yeah. at remote work. Like, like if I'm at home, uh, let me be fair. I like remote work. I can't work from home, right? Cause like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm making two or three meals a day. I'm binge watching something. I'm going to sleep. I'm not going to work. I have to, I have to go somewhere. Right? I don't say I want to go to a cubicle, work forty hours a week, or have some work on my shoulder. I have to go somewhere, right? 
what's your take on so what's your philosophy on that how do you from how do you if you had a company how do you make sure you'd hire people that actually know how to do remote work if that makes sense that makes sense okay i think you just gotta and you know kind of is it does this guy deliver like you can't you, can, you don't really know until they actually work in there you know uh, because if, if you just have a guy that's screwing up period like if you bring him to the office he, he, you'd be probably playing solitaire or something all day like uh but, you know some people they just like like you mentioned like there's too many distractions at home but like you know with you you have the work ethic so you're gonna say oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remove myself from this distracting environment and get to somewhere where I can be more productive. So, you know, they would just have to kind of like look at the character of the person they hired. And, you know, if that person has high enough character, they're going to find an environment to where they that's actually conducive to work. But I don't really believe in like forcing everybody to everybody needs to come to the office. So, you know, I can look over their shoulder. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, Kevin, if you could go back to begin your tech career, is there anything that you would have done differently? No, nah, honestly, probably not because, you know, everything builds on each other, even mistakes. Like if I didn't make this mistake, I would have never had the knowledge to do this differently. Like, for example, this current job that I have now, uh, the, only, the main reason that I got this was uh, I failed an interview prior to that. And, you know, the feedback I got, there was like, okay, he was coding a solution, but he didn't speak out, speak out about his thought process. Like he didn't talk through what he was doing. I didn't even know prior to that you were supposed to do that. Yeah, so. I think that was great. Who did that do you a favor? You might've got the job. I think they did a great favor giving that feedback. Exactly. And, you know, I actually took that to get this current job, which paid more. Like when I, when I did the live coding assignment, I was talking through everything I was doing. So, you know, you got to kind of like, you can't get stuck on your failures. You have to look at them as like, okay, this this is knowledge I can take to improve my game plan. Kevin, do you, is there like a dream tech job out there that you want? Uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I pretty much want to be able to work on what I want to work on, and you know, uh, you know, like even in the game industry, like it sounds cool, but if I'm making somebody else's game, you know, I probably have to do a bunch of crunch this and that. So I, I'll say the dream for me is more like the, the financial freedom, having the freedom of time to work on stuff I want to work on. So most software developers, I'm pretty sure most of them have to have a portfolio, right? Yeah. What would you tell the ones who say, well, I, I'm just going to have a resume. I don't need a portfolio. Yeah, like when I first, when, when you first get in industry, yeah, you have to have a portfolio. But as you become more senior, you know, the companies you get hired at, the body of work speaks for itself. But like it goes back to the question, like you're competing against a thousand youths. So what makes you stand out? Like what, what, what doesn't stand out more than an awesome website? You know what I mean? Like, oh, wow, this is amazing. They can actually visit it. You know what I mean? They can go to the GitHub and see the code. Like that kind of solidifies you as somebody who knows how to develop, you know? So, so Kevin, if people don't know what is GitHub, what's the, what's the, um, What's the purpose of a GitHub? So GitHub is like a, it's a repository to where you can upload your code is, you know, Git is version control. GitHub is like the actual repository. So what like version control is like, if you're into like video games or whatever, think of it almost like a save file for your code. Like you're saving different versions of your code and uh, say multiple users are working on the same code base. You know, Git enables everybody to check in their branch and get their code merged with the, you know, the central repository. And other people can look at your code, see if it's good code, bad code, like source product, you know, like do, do a deep dive on it. Yeah. So, you know, you're checking your actual work into uh, GitHub. So when people can look at your source code directly. So, you know, companies that like to see people's coding habits, they'll just visit your GitHub and they have a direct ability to kind of assess whether your code is up to up to par for their organization. Because most people get help to public, right? Unless they work for a big company, right? I'm guessing. Yeah. So tell me this, tell me if my reason is, is logical here. So as a mm -hmm. non-tech founder, a non-tech founder, so we go on someone's GitHub, right? And they'll mm -hmm. say, okay, uh, Bob the developer has a thousand commits. Now yeah. within a month, we'll say now, 
you probably can't say if it's good code, bad code, no code. Yeah. But in theory, okay, this guy did a thousand commits, and a commit can be something as simple as anything, right? Yeah, but yeah. in theory, you should be able to say, Bob developed a thousand commits in a 30 day time period. In theory, I have to imply that he's working on his credit to make it better, right? Versus someone who has like maybe two commits in the last six months, right? Okay, so, you know, it kind of goes back to that, um, you know, activity does look impressive to a certain level, but like if, if you're a non-tech guy, well, honestly, go reach out to a tech guy to look at it. You know what I mean? Okay. Because, you know, activity is not necessarily good activity. Because a commit could be anything, right? Exactly. So, you know, yeah, you got you to get somebody that kind of assess the, the quality of work of, of what's actually going on. Because a guy that committed six months ago, he, he might be doing something really impressive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something came up to where he just doesn't commit as often, whereas the other guys like doing console, you know, hello yeah. world in 20 different languages. Mm, that's a good point. Um, so any, any, any more advice for non-tech um, founders to bring on the right talent? Yeah, um, honestly, I would say just like anything else, kind of like uh, say you're an athlete and you're playing in the industry, it's imperative that you learn about financial management, even though that's not technically what you're doing, because if you don't, somebody can fleece you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're a non-tech guy, but you're primarily a hiring tech guy, I'm not going to say like you need to learn programming, but learn about the different, like, okay, this Python is good for this, JavaScript is good for that. Like you got to kind of uh, have an idea of the industry of, you know, these people that I'm hiring, I have to know what they're doing. I have to have some sort of idea about yeah. that. So I mean, at least at least speak the language, right? Yeah, exactly. At a, at a bare minimum. Exactly, because otherwise they can just fleece you with throwing around a bunch of buzzwords that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know as a non tech founder, I mean, it, it's it's a challenge finding the right tech team, right? It's yeah, it's not easy, right? It's, it's yeah, it's it's a challenge. I often sometimes think, man. If I go back in time, I actually just learn how to code, right? But they're like, would I really want to learn to code? Do I really have the resources to learn? Like, and you know what I'm, you know what I'm building, Kevin. Okay? Like, it's like it's not like simple website, right? It's like all yeah, this yeah. complicated stuff, right? Do I really have the time to do that? Everything else I'm doing, yeah, it's. That's why I say, look, if you find a good developer, you I, actually I think you need to overpay them, right? Especially if they're doing what you want them to do. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you find a really good guy that's pretty much running the tech thing, get, do what it takes to make them stay there, like you'll save so much money. You know, like a, a problem a lot of companies have, they want to be, uh, they, they, they're thinking short term. So they want to, remember, I don't know if you've seen the post today, uh, it's kind of going viral where the woman say, uh, she, I think she's like a recruiter. She said, oh, okay, we had a budget to offer this, this girl 130K, but uh, I only offered her 85K because that's what she asked for. Yeah, so. it should be gone a, a year or two years easily. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you, you start lowballing people and all of that. You, you save money in the short term, but in the long run, it's way more costly because, okay, this guy is your tech go to guy. So he's going to be bringing people on to the company. So, you know, you want you want that guy to stay there at your company because the turnover is going to be way more costly from hiring a bunch of bad apples. And like, I don't understand like, for people, they do the interviews. They're like, how many you get paid your last job? And well, first of all, it's none of your business, you know, right. you, you, should you, you should be paying, you should be offering my pay while well, you don't know the budget for this company job. You're going to base off my salary from last job. That's BS, right? Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, they, you get a low ball and they get a better offer. It's yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, if you got, if you got a really good guy or a girl or whatever, just pay, pay him, pay him good. Uh, those, they're, you know, like if tech isn't your special team, it's there. They'll save you a lot of money. Yeah, and, and not only taking this, I think every industry is like that nowadays, right? You know, yeah. people getting lowballed, or you know, you know, like, and it just my experience from being in the military, being a couple of like civilian jobs, you know, stuff like that, like, and people may agree or disagree. But my experience, like every every organization I've been with, one to ten, 50, maybe twenty percent of you're lucky, twenty percent of your people are actually like doing good stuff, right? Yeah. They're yeah. So initiative, they're doing they're doing extra right, you know, they're making they make themselves better, the people on them better. Everyone else, I'm not saying they're like horrible employees, but they're doing the bare minimum, right? They're doing nine yeah, to five. Yeah. If you tell them to do ABC, they're doing ABC and that's it, right? And yeah, so yeah. you, you got to take care of that, that 20% and you got to do way things that make sure they'll get burnt out, I think, you know? Exactly. Yeah, those are the guys that, you know, that really make your company go like that, the top 
that that top tier that's self motivated. You know, those, those are the pieces. It, yeah. And I think it's okay to overpay them a little bit, like we were talking about. You know. Mm -hmm. They're, those are the ones that's like kind of irreplaceable. Like you might pay them an extra 10, 20 K, but they'll save you hundreds of thousands or, you know, more. But because of them, you're not going to have a deployment problem at two in the morning because they make sure any potential issues never came up. They're going to like, what's I looking for? They're going to um, troubleshoot or murder board every single possible scenario yeah. and have solutions in there, you know? Exactly. And, you know, like, you know, they, they're not going to just uh, uh, bring their friends onto the company like, that their friends don't know how to really do their job, but oh, I'm cool with this guy. Come on in, you know. Like, yeah. Oh, me, me and Bob drink beer every day, you know. Yeah. He's, he's, he's gonna be my marketing person. Exactly. So yeah, man, it's hiring good people is hard, man. But uh, if you find it, you sometimes you just gotta pay more. It's like anything else in life. If you go for the cheap stuff, it's gonna break and you're gonna have to, you know, pay pay what you originally bought for the quality stuff in the first place. So Oh, like remember that that gum commercial? I can't remember the name of the of the gum. Where like they offered this lady like at like eighty thousand. She said, "No, I want hundred thousand dollars. We don't pay a hundred thousand dollars. You were for me because I'm special. That the unicorn pops out of nowhere, right? I'm, I'm special, you know. If you want me, you gotta pay me a hundred thousand. Or the thing was right. Yeah, you gotta you gotta gotta pay for quality. That's that's how I look at it. So, do you think a lot of people uh, lowball themselves when it comes to like negotiating salaries? Do you think they're like you know? Man, I, I've been looking for a job for six months. I've had yeah. a, you know, 10 interviews. They offer me oh, like yeah. 60,000. I know I'm working 80, you know. Yeah, I know, I know that for a fact. Uh, you know, for your first job, though, I would, I would even recommend taking that low ball offer just to get your foot in the door. And then you can always keep interviewing. But, you know, you don't want to sit around waiting six more months to, uh, uh, try to find out, you know what I mean? Like yeah. that six, I always look at the first two years of sacrifices. You're going to be underpaid. Mm -hmm. And, but once you get those two years experience, that's when the door is really open and you can negotiate what you really want. But, uh, you know, say for example, would I take a 45 K job now versus six months later, 60 K job? I'll take the 40 K five K job now because I, I have six months of experience. Mm -hmm. that's going to let me get find that high paying opportunity sooner you know what i mean because i i'm getting that experience quicker yeah um so kevin is anything i should have asked you that i haven't haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't talked about yet no i think we uh, covered a lot of stuff man uh, so i can't really think of anything off the top of my head so real quick back to your like your you know your linkedin post your social media post and podcast I might ask you this already, but what's, what's your intent behind that? Just to build your personal brand, to you know, help as many people as you want? Like, what's your, so, quote, unquote, what's your end game with that, if it turns out how you want to turn out? Uh, I would say, you know, I, re I really like posting uh, stuff that helps people out. I try to give both sides, you know, I'm not always going to post, like, these motivational things. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, everything's good. Yeah, just yeah, try yeah, th yeah, that's not me either, right? I'm not, I'm not your rah-rah, go team type yeah. of guy, right? Like, you know, I, I hype you up, but I'm going to tell you that, oh, it's not easy. So, you know, go get it, but you got to put that work in. Like, I, I like telling people, give people like more realistic uh, assessment of what's out there, you know, uh, like the end, in terms of the end game, hopefully it blows up and, you know, I can keep on giving that advice, but hopefully I can also like take that money and start working on stuff I actually want to work on, you know? Yeah. And, and you might already talk about this too, but another thing you should be doing too, right? Like you talk about you know, being entrepreneurial, start your own startup. Yeah. Post like a year from now, you start your own startup, right? Building some kind of game. From these engagements, you already have a pool of talent you can pull from to reach out to you. Like, hey, I really like, you know, Tom Brown. I really like Susan Jane. I really like yeah. how they did, you know. Let me reach out to them and see if they want to come work with me, right? So I think that's something you, yeah, definitely you can pull from this too. Exactly. Like, you know, there, there, there's no real disadvantage from not increasing your attraction, you know, your following. Uh, you have a broad, broader people, uh, you know, broad, a broader array of people that you can work with and pull talent from. Though. And people you've never met in real life, right? Like, exactly. never, you know, like I got so many people following me, I'm talking to, engaging to, right? Yeah. I've would, I would never known anywhere, right? Just because it's my own podcast, just me a post, you know, just it's a whole new world, right? And, you know, like a lot of people have been kind of reaching out to me and say, hey, man, that's, uh, that really helped me out. So that, that's a good feeling, like, though. You, you you just think you're just talking about whatever, but 
for some reason that really resonates with them in it. Yeah, you, you definitely got, you, you definitely got a lot of engagements in your post. A lot of junior developers reaching out saying thank you and like and something as simple like um I remember one one a lady did a post like she can't find a job whatever and you reshared mm. it and this like a big time C chill from a big time tech company in California reached out to her like hey I really can't I have no job for you but hey I want to be your mentor right yeah like, yeah, yeah like you know man this young lady got this guy to be her mentor like I like that's you know be literally worth millions of dollars her down the life during her life right I mean like this guy it was a big time right like just because this one post something simple you were sharing it yeah yeah as a, you know I, I really like seeing like you know people who who, who really want to be in the industry getting jobs like you know if, if they're just here like oh I just want some money you know or whatever but if they're like man this is really what I really want to do it feels good for them to just be excited about getting that first opportunity. So Kevin, yeah. let's say you're you're a, a team lead, whatever you're in charge of developers. Yeah. What would a developer have to do or not do for you to say, "Hey, guy, like being a developer is not for you. We would have to let you go." Uh, I'm gonna say, you know, if they keep making the same mistake over and over and over, it's like you're not listening. You know what I mean? And uh, I think sometimes, like, you realize, like, okay, this project is kind of beyond them, like you know everybody's not at the same level so if i have to let them go i'm not just gonna be like oh yeah you're fired i kind of be like you know like look around the company hey uh is, is there another project where i can move this guy to this because this project is a little more advanced or you know like since i'm building up my network on linkedin i'm kind of like i can reach out to other people like hey um you know this guy he's not really a suit for this company do y'all have a little more junior of a role that i can place him at but you know, like if, if he's not able to complete features because it's just, it's just beyond him. And sometimes that happens. Uh, but I, I think another thing is like bad attitude. Like nobody really wants to work around people who just have like a nasty, you know, nasty attitude. Yeah, that's the worst thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. So your current job that you have, your, your, we call it your nine to five. Did you have to get permission from them to do a social media post? Or is this something you're doing separate, separate from that? It's like two different things. Oh yeah, I just, I just do it, man. Okay. Uh, it, I know with like certain big companies like Google or stuff, some they don't really want you to have a. Yeah, I mean, because you, okay, I mean, because you never mention your company in, in any of your exactly. posts like that. You just keep it like, I guess, yeah. to be pro personal, professional. I guess. Yeah, yeah. I try to leave like company specific stuff out of it, so. That's that's good because a lot of companies like you get permission and stuff, which I don't know about that. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I know, I know like for Google and Facebook and all of that, they, they'll kind of tell you no, probably. Like, we don't want you doing social media. Yeah. Uh, so, what what is the so you live in the Dallas Fort Worth area? Yeah. What is like the tech startup scene there? Are, are you involved with that in, in the tech scene, tech or startup scene there in any kind of way there? How is there? How is that there? Uh, yeah, I'm not too involved like locally. Uh, you know, most of the stuff I do is kind of online. I, don't, I wouldn't even really know where to you know, reach out to people like in the local tech startup scene. I think Austin is more like a tech startup yeah. bubbling area. That's, that's more yeah. like the Bay Area of Texas. Yeah. I think DFW is more corporate. Yeah, probably so, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're pretty happy with your job you have right now. Do you have, do you have any plans? Are you, are you gonna like every six months look for a job and see what's out there for you? Or what's your plan on that? How you, what's your uh, plan on that? You know, recently I've been kind of like, you know, I've been telling like a ton of different recruiters, oh, I'm not really looking for a job, but now it's more so like, if they present a, I, I just say, hey, uh, I want like 180K. But they say, okay, yeah, I'll say, yeah, well, I guess I'll do the interview. They're like, okay, that's all you want, come on, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I might be lowballing myself. It seems like uh, you could probably, I probably can say 200K, you know. I'm just, yeah, I'm just I know in the Seattle area, it's like, I think 200K is like starting point in Seattle if you're like a decent developer. But of course, oh, you know, wow. yeah, I think, I think, of course, you know, you have Google, Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. Expedia, you know, it's a pretty big tech hub up here. And yeah, I know it's way I, more expensive over there too. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Of course, I've $200,000 might be low ball, high wall, you know, but yeah, one I thing like, I would definitely say, remember, if you're a developer, HR, market, whatever, definitely know your value, like figure out the labor market, right? Cause a lot of people are like, oh, I'm worth 80,000. Yeah. You're worth 80,000, like Dallas, Texas. But you probably work 125 in Seattle, 160 in San Francisco, right. or you might be only what's 55 in you know I don't know Temple, Texas, right? It's yeah, exactly. and the size of the company, right? You know, 
you're gonna get paid more on Amazon than you're gonna get paid for like you know some company of two hundred people in there, right? Right. Not profit. And and you know, it's, re, definitely reset your labor market. Know what you're worth. And it's kind of like why it's uh, important to, to build to build up your visibility. Like they might be like, okay, he's in DFW. Normally, I won't only give him 180k, but since this guy is really bubbling and you know what he's talking about, we need to have him. So he can he can have 200. We'll, we'll pay him more than normal for that area just to get him. Let's get, get some point. And another big thing talking on the Bay Area, I'll be using Bay as an example. Like some companies are like tech companies there, like, you know, a lot of people are remote and they're like, okay, I'm paying, you know, I'm paying Jason 120000 a year. Yeah. I'm paying $120,000 a year because I know San Francisco is so expensive. Yeah. Jason moved back to Dallas. Dallas expense, I'm, I'm going to take 120 80000 right? Yeah. And, and Jason was like, hey, what are you doing? I, I, I paid $120,000. And the company messed up. They didn't explain, hey, this extra money because you live in the Bay Area. Yeah. A lot of times I was saying, hey, I'll still pay 120000 I don't care where you live at, right? Exactly. I, I think a lot of companies are getting that wrong. The, the, the messaging and the optics have been wrong, right? Like they said, no, ahead of time, hey, I'm paying Jason 120, but 80 is a salary, 40,000, because, hey, we don't live in a freaking car, cardboard box in San Francisco. Yeah. Because the company said, go back home to Dallas. Hey, you know, we can't afford 120,000. You live in Dallas, right? But some companies are like, you know, are still paying the big money no matter where you live at. So, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting concept, an interesting dynamic people are going through right now. Yeah, I think because you know from the programming standpoint, it's like I'm still turning the same quality of code. Are you paying yeah. for where I live at, or are yeah. you paying for my contribution to the company? Yeah, you know, just like in the military, you know this. You know, in the military, you might get paid two thousand dollars housing allowance to live in like the Seattle area, but only nine hundred live in Colleen, right? You know. Yeah. And just like, when, yeah, and just like when I had, I had this, my first post army job was I worked at Trident Seafoods. Uh, they paid me like a free housing, flights mm -hmm. back and forth. It probably came like 20000 a year, but like, hey, this $20,000, that's don't include it in my compensation. That's for me to even come up here, right? But they saw it differently, yeah. right? So, yeah, I, I think a lot of tech companies messed that up. They messed up their message, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, like, yeah, if you, can, you, can't, you can't dial people back uh if they move because they're gonna get mad and they probably yeah. leave. i mean yeah that's a big pay cut from of course make the numbers up but go from 120 to 80 thousand it just says you move. yeah like first of all i had to move because like you know covid and stuff you know or whatever you know case would be yeah. and maybe the company said hey you know if if you move we want to cut your pay maybe i think a lot of companies messed up and they tell the people until after they moved to another place right hey you yeah. move you're gonna lose forty thousand. like and they yeah, probably I, plan to do, do something about the forty thousand. and i think you know when you first negotiate your salary you got to pretty much okay 120, this is our default rate set. We're adding 20,000 because you live in San Francisco. If you move from here, we're down yeah. that and Tell them up front. Yeah, a lot of people do not do that, you know. Of course, you know, who could have predicted COVID and all that stuff, you know? Yeah, cool. exactly. Hey, Kevin, um, can you share your social media for, you, for, your, for yourself to, to, to include your podcast and all that kind of stuff so people can reach out to you? Oh, man, uh, yeah. You know, with YouTube, they don't give you the, the dynamic URLs. Oh, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. So after you get a certain amount, so it's just like a bunch of random characters. But uh, yeah. uh, let, let me look at my LinkedIn. I guess that would okay. be the easiest way for okay. people to reach in, reach out to me. Uh, let's see. And what's the name of your podcast? Uh, it's called Coder Conversations. Uh, yeah, my LinkedIn is linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash KEVM254. All right. And so listen, we'll share his uh, social media links and for his social media podcast on the show notes. You can find, find the show notes at www.kevinsaysobola.com. Be sure to share this episode with your networks and be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cabinet Experience on your favorite podcast podcast platform. So Kevin, we're coming to the end of our talk and you give us some great value and great advice. So last thing, can you give us a quick snippet on any advice, any wisdom you want to talk about? Yeah, I would say uh, just stay persistent. Don't quit. There's a lot of challenges, but if you stick with it, keep analyzing, keep adjusting, you know, eventually you're going to, to get where you need to go. You know, the, the race goes to those who endure. Kevin, thank you for your time tonight. I really appreciate it. All right, man. I appreciate you inviting me on, man. It was a good conversation. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.